you're married? Yeah, well, not um, not technically yet. In December, we're gonna go have a, a Vegas wedding. Yeah. But the only reason we're not currently officially officially married is just because COVID happened. And right. We're like, I'm not gonna go fill out the goddamn paperwork until we can go do a thing, and we're not gonna go do a thing with like <laughs> plastic sheets hanging in between us. And just we just waited it out, and then it was like, oh, like a little while ago when we got vaccinated and stuff. They were like, oh, yeah, and like mid-December, Vegas is like, like I rented like a penthouse to have our wedding and it was like 500 bucks or something. Like it, it was just, just dirt ass cheap because oh, it's wow. the week before Christmas and our families are all, they're like, hey, do you want to come out here for this? Like airfare is nothing, whatever. And they're like, you know, because all their kids are grown up like, oh, yeah, let's go do that. That's fine. Sure. Like, and then so we kind of threw it together. But yeah, I mean, I bought a house and stuff during the My life during the pandemic kind of got. I mean, less insane, but more better, like yeah. a little bit more stable. Kind of, like I actually started uh, taking anti-anxiety stuff, which probably overdue for, which kind of contributed to me drinking a bit less. And then like, you know, I'm like a homeowner and I'm getting married. I'm like, yeah, at 40, maybe it's time to not live like <laughs> I'm 19. Like yeah, so you're, much anymore. You're adulting, dude. I'm adulting. That's why we're a good time. Cosplaying as a grown-up. There you go. Well... <laughs> I think we, we, you and I have both come a long way since, say, 2006 when you and I first met. And we could go into that. And, and real quick, okay, because I'm rolling right now. I want to introduce you. Okay. I, got, I have Mr. John Wheeler. Uh, for, Hello. I have Mr. John Wheeler, who is um, speculated to be my cousin by, yeah. ma- by many, but um, not blood related. But but definitely related as far as a, a mindset and a, a, a drive and a will to be weird. I would say we are related in in that manner. Yes. And, yeah. Uh, we're, we're go ahead. <laughs> yeah, we're weird. Um, I actually okay. So I was going over this footage. Um, that was on our DVD, and it was at one of the parties at Cass's house. What was that house called? Chugalug House. Chugalug. Yeah, that was the famous St. Paul. Um, because one of our buddies actually he became a homeowner strangely early for everyone. So like, rather than um, a bunch of dudes renting a house, it was a bunch of dudes renting a house from another weird dude. We were friends. Yeah. With. I mean, I didn't live there, but that got so famously out of control because we actually <laughs> learned through him that like when the cops come and there's a noise complaint and they're like, okay, is the homeowner here? And someone actually, yeah, that's actually me. They're like, Oh, well, um, uh, guys, could you please just maybe instead of like, well, you, you bunch of fucks better shut up. <laughs> So yeah. we kind of took that as an uh, excuse to be incredibly destructive all the time. Yeah. And, uh, so, and you've joined us. Oh, absolutely. And I started doing live streaming uh, with the onset of the pandemic. I always, I always was just a, like, I'm only going to do concerts kind of guy, but I've kind of had to adapt quickly because I needed to find a way to monetize my weirdness during the pandemic yeah. and stay sane. So I started doing live stream. We did this thing where we on stream – even though it, it probably violated terms of service, we watched a lot of cl- a lot of clips from that old DVD. And there's a clip where I'm like passed out drunk on the toilet. And oh, and you wake up and you're like, yeah, yeah, ex- exactly. <laughs> and uh, that was at Chuggalug House. And and then you pop in, you just pop your head and you go, "Happy birthday, Neil!" Because I guess it was on my birthday. Um, yeah, it was. And uh, there was another remembrance. I mean, we could go into. There's so much we can go into because we, we, oh, yeah. we have war stories. Uh, but there was a day where I was so blacked out that I was just drinking pretty much any alcohol I could get my hands on. And I think uh, the members of SMB and downtown Brown took turns peeing into a Jack Daniels bottle, which yes. I, w- which, <laughs> which I in turn ingested because I, <laughs> cause I couldn't tell. And, and a and B didn't care whether or not it was piss or liquor. I just wanted to put more liquids in me. So well, I should say, though, that was part of a longer uh, uh, sort of chain of events where I remember it was <laughs> and this was in Michigan. I don't remember a different thing where we would often just pee in all of the bottles because we'd be up later than everyone. And everybody would be like, <laughs> like, oh, is there any more booze left? And we're like, well, this, but it's just pee. And they're like, well, what? you're just trying to keep it for yourself. But it's like, really long, it's like, it's pee. I'm telling you it's pee. And they're like, yeah, right. And they just take a drink like. Oh, this is piss. Like, yeah, I told you, and then you drank it. Yeah, how many times do I got to tell you it's piss for you to believe me it's piss? Yeah. Yeah. And I don't even know where to start with all this because this is, this is, this this might like. How did we meet? Why did, why did us happen? Like, I guess downtown Brown and SMB, we know that 
part. My space. I know you for that reason, but that doesn't narrow it down completely. That's just like that. Yeah, it's band stuff. But like, were we just booked on a show with you somewhere? Was it because of Tub Ring or something? Yeah, like I have vague remembrance of it, but I think most of it has to do with Harry Bob and MySpace. Harry Bob joined the band. Harry Bob had a van, and we started doing regional touring. And um, yeah, we st- we started reaching out to bands that were weird. Then like, you can search right. you could search bands by city back in yep. the MySpace days because now nowadays it's harder to do on any social media app. Just be like, okay, find alternative weird bands in Minneapolis, and then. But I don't. I don't. I can't exactly put my finger on how it happened, but I remember y'all came to Detroit was the first time we actually officially met. You came and played the magic stick with us. Yeah, it was that magic stick show that had that guy in a speed of the party dream. Gil Manteros party dream. Yes. Yeah, it was the opener because, and yeah, like other fan, wait, were we there with like the Super 8-Bit Brothers? Like, yes. I swear it was because... You knew Rob Kleiner from Tubbering. Yes. And that had something to do with it. It's hard to put a it's hard to put a finger on it, but it was it was around 2005, I believe. Yeah. Or or st- it was four. It was right before we toured with MSI. Because it was like yes. we, we that was like the furthest we'd gotten out of town. Well, no, we'd been in Florida with Retardo Bot, but it was still when we hadn't really ran around everywhere yet. We were like, yeah. well, how about how about we play in Michigan with downtown Brown? Like that was somebody's suggestion. And it's like, oh, and then we did, and that was fun. And then we kind of traded shows around. Then we did the MSI tour. Then we all kind of met Foxy Shazam and like Psycho Stick. And then we all yeah. did a lot of that. Yeah. To like, I, I remember where it went. <laughs> like, eventually it comes yes. into a lot of shows. But yeah, like initially, it was, yeah, it was some kind of just MySpace, like, hey, this will be fun. Like, you should play with these guys, which is how everything used to happen. Right. It was. It was Chelsea's. Chelsea followed all the bands. She followed. That was why. She followed Downtown Brown. She followed uh, Tub Ring, SMB, Party Dream. She was into all the weird music, and it was her birthday party. That, that was why. That was it. Yep. She booked us and you and Eight Brothers and uh, Gil. Man, yeah, like that's and, it, and none of us. Well, I knew Rock and the Eight Brothers. I knew them, but none of us really knew each other. <laughs> they were just like, no. we're all on this thing, and then we all like went to an apartment party or something and then that that was that was yeah that was it i think that might have been at swisher's uh apartment in livonia or plymouth and uh yeah the, there was like a laundry room down in the basement yada yada I re- so that was later that oh, was, was that later okay yeah 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 that was <laughs> when that was when yours truly had amassed perhaps slightly more female fans and began to live his life the way i did for many years and i'm now retired but yeah yeah that that was a little later on because like that bob chick was there and uh joey and the all, all these girls with boy names and we <laughs> never had a third really uh girls with boy th- names. yeah that was that was a whole separate that very first one was just this random like efficiency apartment that's maybe you guys weren't even at the thing i think who we knows just played the show and then we all went somewhere to sleep and by sleep i mean drink till the sun came up and then sleep right whatever but yeah yeah because you guys were like well we live here you know we're just gonna go about our business after you fucking idiots get done with this show with us or whatever well we played the magic stick together more than once i think yeah you were there the night i blacked out on stage and uh oh yeah yeah that was that was before like the big long six week tour we did together where we went to New York and harassed people uh, on the stoop. Yeah, we found the stairs from Sesame Street, just sat there and yelled at every different kind of person that exists in the world that walked by at one point or another because that's what New York's like. Why well, it's fun to visit? Yeah, you drink it was like Ghostbusters. It was like it's like oh, there's a bunch of like Hasidic Jews guys with like the 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 leopard print dashikis. Like it was like someone cast a film. Of like, yeah, 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 we need New York. We need everybody to walk down the street. <laughs> so it, it looks like these guys are hanging out where it's happening. But it was like for really happening. And yeah, there was like a homeless lady that was hitting on our old merch guy, Scode. I think it was and, Cass. Oh, yeah, yeah. She might have been. She's like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> yeah. And we used to hang out with a lot of um, uh, houseless people back at those. I remember like <laughs> you guys. Was it your drummer you had at one point just slept on a park bench and was just like drinking 40s in the morning with people who normally slept on the park bench there? Quite possibly. 
I think Glover, yeah. Glover, Don. Don Don's still around. Don is a homeowner and a father. And uh, Don, Don, Don actually is a higher up at his job. Get this. Don is his dad and his uh, two older brothers' boss. He outranked them at work. So now his, his older brothers and his dad take fucking orders from Don, a.k.a. Glover, young Don. But uh, yeah, in a, wow, in a strange, strange turn of events. But let's go back to it was it, I don't know if it was 06 or 05 but I remember that show because Owen at the time yeah. had that big ass fucking Chevy that blue Chevy van the torpedo and yeah. and I remember we were parked funny outside of the magic stick and I was like okay Harry Bob give me the keys I'm going to move your van and I actually side swiped the SMB van the first night we met you guys and uh, and I remember because I didn't know how to drive a van back then. Harry Bob drove all the time. I was just the you know the big fat loud drunk guy, you know. Yeah. And, and so I, I actually sideswiped Owen's van, and I remember that's like was one of the first impressions y'all had of me was like, hey, this guy invited us to the show and just hit our van. But it, it wasn't luckily it wasn't like huge structural damage, but definitely a scrape for sure, a scrape. Yeah, I, th- I think it was like a dent, but the. <laughs> I think the irony of that is just that like any concern about that is in those earlier days, any of our tour vehicles were just Owen's daily drivers. And he was like an eight year old with rage problems, but with a driver's license, it's like the (laughs) transmissions on those things. Like, Oh yeah, just floor it uphill around these guys that, that, that haunted you uh, with six guys in a trailer and uh, just be like, Oh, oh, we all got to pay for this transmission. I mean, it went out like, uh, yeah, okay. Like, so anything you did to it is, is nothing compared to just blowing the engine up regularly. I always said we might have came out in the black a little financially if it weren't for like, well, we need a new engine like every five seconds. Right. Well, that's good to know. I just remember, uh, you know, because you get this perception of, of bands and or people from the Internet. You check them out. You see what they're all about. You see what they look like. You listen to the music. And then like based on the amount of plays y'all had on MySpace, I was like, OK, this is a band that is doing well. This is a band that we want to become friends with. We want to impress and we want to join forces with. And, you know, the first night we meet y'all, I fucking <laughs> like just hit the fucking car. But I think that was a, that was a good like uh, like a litmus kind of uh occurrence for what was to become like a, a few years of ridiculous debaucherous adventures you know yeah i think so i mean i think it was you know i can't really say because you only live in your own skin and all but you know what other people's experiences and bands either before that era or after that era or anyone that wasn't any of us you know what it was like for them but just the level of of hanging by a thread out of controlness that fueled and i you know i've been been, like i love watching your you know i recently got into tiktok and i love watching your clips and you tell the the warp tour tour stories that i recall oh yeah all that and it's it's very familiar but it's like there's there's kids out there that you know and they're probably not millionaires doing anything either but at the very least there's like oh their parents were helping them figure out like all right guys well you gotta have a business plan and you're gonna go out on tour for in between you know when you go to college and we're just like uh, like we would have just been living outside anyway if we weren't in bands. <laughs> we just were. We're like, oh yeah, like yeah, like ramming our vehicles together, just being at Niagara Falls, wrecking someone's vacation by screaming about <laughs> diarrhea and the fucking thing or whatever. It's just like, well, yeah, that's what you do, right? I mean, like it's like the '70s still. You just do whatever you want all the time and just hope it works out. Like I, I don't know if that was the rule or the exception. Like it's hard to really piece that together for me. Well, in my mind, I was in art school and I'm like, I don't want to do this shit anymore. So I quit. I just quit. And I, I had a scholarship. I was I was like getting a, a decent amount of money towards everything. And I just quit. And I'm like, I'm going to be in a band. And that, that was the entire thought process. It had nothing else. T- there was no other fucking thoughts that had to do with it. It was just like, fuck this. I'm quitting. I'm being in a band. And, and I'm like, I'm going to make it work. I like had this super young like kind of fucking cockiness about it. I'm just like, yeah, it's just like, I'm just going to do this. And we all did. Yeah. And you have to have that or otherwise you would just go, this idea is crazy. And I'm just going to, you know, get get an engineering degree and actually make money or whatever. But all of us were like, and I mean, it could, you know, in my case, it was just like, well, the best I was about to do is maybe regional manager of some super Americas or something. If I'm lucky, (laughs) like those were like, 
my parents' financial status <laughs> and my opportunities. I'm like, well, if I tried really hard, I could do something that you would never want to do to kind of scrape by. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to live in hell then. Like, <laughs> like I wasn't giving up. Like, well, my dad was like, son, I want you to inherit this company. It was just kind of more like, well, hey, by the way, what are you going to do? Because, you know, we're not paying for college. We're like, uh, well, goodbye. I'm going to buy a van, I guess. I'll see you. And that, <laughs> but that cockiness was like, all right, well, that's stated. This is obviously going to work out, though. Like, I'm going to be Trent Reznor. That's how this is going to go. So off off we go. Like, yeah, it was just a foregone conclusion that, of course, not only us, but you guys are retarded about everyone that we were ever around. It's like, we're all going to be, you know, they're going to remember us the way boomers remember Zeppelin and Floyd. And like, that's going to be us. Yeah, that's, of course, how this is going to, that's what I thought until like 2013. And I was like, ah, okay, well, maybe this is just for fun. I joined a few other bands. And then eventually I was like, oh, hey, this isn't fun anymore. <laughs> maybe I'll do stand up because my back hurts too much to drag a bass cab up a flight of stairs and, you know, whatever. And then, and then it's like, oh yeah, hey, wait, I actually learned how to do something people will pay for it. Well, that's not too bad. And they still like me. So I'm getting some attention. Okay, cool. But at that time, I don't think anyone, you, no one should feel bad for being a little cocky because if we weren't so cocky, we would have just done something else right. with our lives. Well, it's funny you say 2013 because 2013 is the year I had the big light bulb tour that we were on this big tour and we just put out this new record. And I'm just like, wow. I'm like, this really, in, in X amount of years, in 12, 12 years, this really hasn't amounted to what I thought it was going to amount to, A, and B, 2013 was also the year that my back gave out, and I realized that, <laughs> I, that I had, um, you know, I have degenerative disc disease in my neck, and I have two bulging discs in my lumbar spine, and I, I got on Medicaid, and I actually got x-rays and an MRI, and they're like, oh, your back is fucked, but, um, mm. but yeah, but I, like, yeah. Yeah, 2013, the eye-opening year where you realize you're not a kid anymore. You're in your 30s and and all of your fucking hopes and dreams and all of the yeah. all of the big grandiose expectations you had for your quote music career. You kind of, like I was just like, "Hey, oh, okay." So I had to kind of accept um, okay, this is reality and decide like whether or not I wanted to like keep doing music or find other shit to do. And I'm still doing it to like to a degree, but I'm definitely not sitting on a stoop in New York city, yelling at strangers, like getting blackout no, drunk. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? So yeah, I mean, that's cause I, it took, it was weird. It would, it was like, it's 2013. Cause it, that's when I broke up SMB, but, or dissolved, yeah. I guess. But it, I still joined blue Felix. I still was like, because I was like, okay, maybe the problem is, is that I'm tired of being in charge. Although I ended up writing an album <laughs> because I have right. a problem, but, but I was like, I'll just play bass. Like the singer has like a bus. He like, he's like used to be a bus mechanic. It's his problem. Like, I'm just going to go with and get my dick sucked and do drugs <laughs> and just play the fucking bass and, and, and just whatever. And I mean, me and Jake are so good buddies. I mean, he was on my podcast, like on Saturday, but, um, I was like, okay, maybe that's just it. And then I kind of had my, my zero things. It's like, well, I want to sing and do a thing with keyboards in it still and have fun locally. But I eventually quit Blue Felix. Cause I was like, even with my own bunk in a bus, occasionally like playing on a, you know, the sun was, would still be up on the third stage, but you know, like opening for Slipknot Disturbed, like Blue Felix got around. Was yeah, like, yeah. Uh, that's not really doing it for me, but maybe because I'm just playing bass. Maybe I just want to be doing it for me. So I was still in my zero for a few years. And then right before the pandemic, I stopped doing my zero. Cause I was like, I hate being in rock bands. <laughs> like, this fucking blows ass. Like, I just, I like making music. And yeah, I, yeah. you know, like my 20s, 19, I, my, my year of income. And I should say equivalent to someone who, you know, is just doing retail full time, but without doing retail full time. So, Hey, was just producing another band on a record label's record. And yeah. kind of, by producing, I mean, writing the whole thing for them. But right. like, I learned that <laughs> that was really fun to like, be able to be like, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm paying mortgage and eating and I'm like making synthesizer lines and stuff. And then just like when five rolls around, I'm like, well, my wife's going to be off work at the hospital. I think I'll start grilling some pork chops. Okay, cool. Instead, instead of sitting on a stoop in New York, screaming at people, which <laughs> I'm glad I did <laughs> because I, I should also say that, Per our collective memories and stuff, when we go, oh, our grandiose dreams didn't quite pan out where I was like the next Antichrist superstar or something. Right. <laughs> when you talk to other people that did it and stopped, 
they still look at people like us and be like, yeah, but bro, you guys like went out there and did, you know, blah, 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 blah. like I'll talk to someone from, you know, just be here and they're like, you toured with MSI and Foxy Shazam. I'm like, yeah, okay, that, yeah, that did happen. So, I mean, it's like that weird thing where I, I couldn't have asked for it to work out better. We're at around 40 years old. I was like, it's time to be a person. Yeah. And I'm like, if I had started being a person at 20 right now, I'd probably be full of like weird. Oh, I wish I would have done. Like, I just have those memories yeah. and all those bumps on my dick. And that's <laughs> fine. We all know where they came from. Like, it's like I, I, you know, the reason you're so good at this is the same reason you have a few of those. That's cool. Okay, whatever. And then you know, uh, settle down now. Like, I think I think that you couldn't like when if, if I were to get bitter, I would slap myself and be like, I don't think it could have worked out a lot better, man. Like you it, it was it was a roller coaster. I met you. Yeah. You know, I met Peter Pepper and, and, and Sky and Eric Alley and uh, you know, like I wouldn't have had that if I didn't sit on that stoop <laughs> for a few decades. Absolutely. And and that's something that I mean through therapy and and medication and you know, because once I got rid of the booze. That in oh, yeah. what was it? Oh eight is when I quit drinking because I got tired of pissing myself all the time. Um, mm. That's when it really hit me that hey, uh, I have underlying mental health conditions that I have been self medicating since I was sixteen for, and that a lot of that uh, revolved around childhood trauma and the being in the abuse I suffered from my father and my house and yada yada. Anyone who listens to this podcast knows the whole story, but it's um. Yeah, it's like once you started looking at your life through the, the the like a clear lens, and you can start actually being like, okay, well, I I have to essentially start over without this crutch, which was the alcohol for me, and and that was like my lubricant yeah. for any sort of uh, social interaction. It was my lubricant to get on stage and say all that outlandish shit. It was my lubricant to you know be this fearless cartoon version of myself that would that would just do all of this crazy shit. And, and then looking back at some of those videos and whatnot, it's like, it's like, yo, that, that wasn't me. That was like a strange fucking. Yeah, the devil was just ru- steering yeah. for a while. Yeah. And, and so let's get into, cause what I wanted to ask is because you like, we had a similar kind of way about us on stage where we were, yeah. where we were self-destructive and we just wanted to say like whatever we could say to offend as many people as possible. Um, yeah. We just wanted to fucking wreck shit. Now, would you, would you say that the the way you operated in a live setting, did, did any of that have to do with underlying anxiety? Like, did you have anxiety back then or is it something that developed later? Like go, go into that a little bit because I've been watching your TikTok content and I'm uh, genuinely curious because I'm mentally ill. So we are. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, well, uh, yeah, you know, the funny thing is, is, is a- addressing some of my shit, you know, now it gives me a good excuse to look back kind of at everything and whatever and, and, and where it came from. And I've realized, and also this is a little bit of why I quit music, kind of. I mean, and again, yeah. I didn't quit music because I'll, I'll produce records. I've made other people's right. podcast intro music. I, I, I like making it. It's super fun. But yeah, um, I used to and i still have a place in my heart for it but i used to just be in love with chaos like i (laughs) absolutely my favorite thing in the like getting blown and doing coke has nothing on like oh we played this show and it got so out of control that like the power went out and the cops showed up and some guy punched somebody like that for me was the that was better than a mother's love Like it was just the best thing in the world. And I, why that is exactly, it's a little hard to say like the love of chaos, but the love of chaos is what, cause sometimes I'd be dead sober and on stage, like just occasionally I would drink too. Right. But, and drinking was definitely a bit of a crutch, but every once in a while I was just like, yeah, that didn't, we'd be doing an all ages show or whatever. And I usually would be like, good enough not to sneak booze. If there was a bar, I'd be like, Oh, let's have some drinks. Like, but if it was like, yeah, it's kids. Like, I don't know. Maybe I'll drink later. Maybe tomorrow. Um, it was still like a big part of my life, but it, it wasn't the driving force for how ridiculous everything always was. It probably made it worse here and there, but I, I it was just, I wanted like yelling stuff to upset people to <laughs> me with me seeing a little bit, there being like a little bit of a fire 
like a campfire. Like, oh, these kids are kind of moshing, but some people over there are kind of bored. I'm like, no, this needs to go off out of control. Like, I need to say something so the people in the back push the kids having fun out of the way in the front and start trying to fight me. Because then, and then those kids might be like, hey, fuck you, I like this guy. And I'm like, ooh, now we got a ball game. Like, <laughs> and where, I, that, dude, I guess- where that maybe came from is just the fact that I, I grew up with such a, and this is going to be such a white American bitchy thing, but I just grew up with such a like, like, you know, we weren't on food stamps. Like we were like just above that. We lived in a trailer for a while, but we did have a house eventually, but I still went to like this drab, like public school with 300 kids in it, like in a suburb of Minneapolis. That was like, like I, other kids were like, Oh, we, we took a criminology course and we got to go to the morgue. It's like, Nope, we get home economics. You don't get to do anything. And if you again, if you get to try real hard, you could be the manager of the local hardware store. How about that? Like, and I kind of <laughs> knew as a kid where I was like, well, okay, like me, I kind of have the blood of the wolf of wall street in me, but there's no way to make that happen. I know it's like, Oh, your parents connected to anybody. And it's like, well, their boss at the, at the bank branch, they work at, I'm like, okay. So <laughs> when everyone was like, sit up straight and do good. And it's like, well, I do as good as everyone else. Like, uh, you know, Hey, it's America. Anything could happen. That's a lie we tell. But I mean, you know, between you and me, no. So I'm like, you know, what would be cool. If all of this was always on fire, that would be it. Blood was just spraying out of everything and flames were shooting. I mean, those shows we set up, even at the garage where I worked at a venue <laughs> that I'd bring you guys to, you'd be doing stuff that would get anyone kicked out of there, but I'd be in charge. I'd be like, no, Neil can put hamburgers down his pants and like launch it into the audience with a slingshot. And I'm like, this is what I want. And they'd be like, should we call someone about this? I'm like, this is good. This needs to happen. These kids need to watch this and realize that the world is, a, is, is an insane cartoon nuclear bomb that never stops exploding. And they're part of it, whether they like it or not. And that, that was it. So my, you know, it, it extended beyond even me being on stage to other people being on stage when yeah. I had some control over a, a venue that you could actually get some people to be like, no, this should always be like psychotic. Like this should always be a tornado because just, I, I, get, I think it was just those limited options. And I was like, I get it that there's people that have it. Like you and me, if you take the whole world and all of history into account, are in the upper 1% of everything. Of course. You really think about it. We're not of course. spearing rats in a dump to fucking feed our eight children. Like no. it, we're, you know, it, we're lucky as fuck. Yeah. But per our experiences, we're like, well, this is just a bunch of nothing. And everyone's like, well, follow the rules. I'm like, I don't think that's going to get me anywhere. Let's not do that. And, and that, you know, for me, I think that's where it came from. And then just dumping booze on it made it, you know, slimier and, and slurrier and more naked yeah know? yeah <laughs> well I, yeah I, and that's the thing is like i never even really considered i think i knew in the back of my head that yeah because because john wheeler invited us to this venue and he's like one of the yeah. higher ups that's why we can slingshot cheeseburgers into fucking teenagers faces you know <laughs> that was exactly why and we did <laughs> We fucking got we got one of those fucking three person slingshots and we were firing fucking McDonald's burgers into kids' faces. Yes, <laughs> lovely. But um, but I, I wanted to bring yeah because the whole chaos thing is something. Yeah, I, I think you and I are pretty similar as far as that's concerned because I I was raised. I got good grades. I was on the National Honor Society. I played football. But there was a part of me, I like smoked all this weed and I did drugs. And I was just like, I, it was weird. It was like, I, I wanted to be a complete scumbag. But I also was like, okay, well, I need to achieve though, just so I can keep my profile low. But after high school got over, I just went full scumbag, you know? Yeah. And, and, it, and uh, when you were telling the story about the chaos and wanting to fucking light everything on fire, it reminds me of this one time we played in Angola, Indiana. And, like, I haven't talked to Pat Swisher in over a decade. He's, he's actually, he is, like, as fun and charming and, like, fun-loving as he was back in those days. He really became, like, it, it, the veil kind of lifted and we really realized that he was, like, a really problematic person that made a lot of people uncomfortable. And he would, uh, you know, cross boundaries that were i mean even legal boundaries like it got to the point where we couldn't associate with him anymore because he straight up was like saying he wanted to kill people and he would he would do just terrible things but there's one thing that he did which i thought was the fucking pinnacle of awesomeness and it, ha it has a lot to do with you know watching the entire world burn we're playing all these covers and we're drunk in angola indiana and it's a redneck fucking audience and these rednecks are getting pissed because we, we're doing our originals and we're getting snotty they're asking us to play like 
Skinnered or whatever. And at, yeah. so, at some point, we start antagonizing the audience and getting real gay with it, like blowing them kisses and like shaking our butts in their face. And then the, and then Swisher actually, he put he put two, his index and middle finger in some guy's drink that was like heckling us from the stage. He just walked up to his drink and he just dipped his fingers in the drink. And then the whole crowd tried to fucking fight us. <laughs> and uh it was it was just wild because it went like and i was so drunk i was like almost blacked out but i was i was sober enough to remember that the the venue security had they escorted us off the stage to protect us from the audience that wanted to fucking destroy us and <laughs> and while all this was happening like harry bob was the straight guy and he always was a straight guy because he owned the van and he was a sober guy and we we got whisked away by the venue security into our vehicle they're like get the fuck out of here while there was like a, <laughs> there was a fucking army of rednecks because of swisher and because of me being super gay on stage that they, they were yeah. they were ready to fucking kill us and there was some and i remember the vague remembrances i have in my brain of that whole thing it's like it's like it's a slow motion like movie that has classical music playing in the background like there was something poetic and and wonderful about it and yeah that was that was a thing that got me off like like knowing that we just ruined everything same thing about warp tour <laughs> Same thing with Warp Tour. There was something poetic and lovely about that, even though we totally squandered this giant opportunity. There was something that I, I was almost like proud of about that. But I think a lot of that had to do with my sickness um, and just how deep I was in alcoholism. But, but yeah, that, yeah, I had to go into that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's totally. And again, I mean, that is the thing where we could we could trade these all day long because I did the one of the yeah you we could we could subdivide these into like okay. Which ones were out of control because the whole redneck audience wanted to kill you? Which one was out of control because it was like an all ages show and what you were doing on stage is probably super illegal if you really think about it. Like, <laughs> Oops. You know, it's like what you know, which ones were like fucked up because yeah. I I just want to say that I remember there's we were playing with Endorphine, who are from Orlando and Psycho Stick, and we we're yeah, playing I know, in Orlando. I know Jimmy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it's been uh, a minute. It was it was just kind of like one of those like low ceiling venues, but it was jam packed and like turf. Who would just wear only a pink mini skirt and like no shirt? Yeah, and he would let me write. By let me, I mean I was going to do it, but I would sharpie something on his very thin torso every night. That was like the worst thing ever, but he wouldn't be able to see it, <laughs> and I would just do that before we went on stage. So I'd always put like. God is gay or Jesus sucks or just something <laughs> that he yeah, couldn't yeah. see. And I think it was Jesus sucks. And he went, like, some people were throwing shit. But I mean, again, when there's like 200 people in a place that holds 150 people, it, it gets scary. Well, I guess it's scary. If people are throwing shit and there's like three people in a place that holds 150. But like, he ran down the bar, which was within leaping distance of one corner of the stage. Yeah. It just, like, just fucking karate kid axe kicked like everyone's drink up and thrown from in front of just into the wall and ceiling in everyone's face and that was one of our times where they had to be like okay guys like we, we got to kind of cordon off and shuffle you into your van because these people are fucking mad like you kick broken glass you know, <laughs> people's shit and the people sitting at the bar with their because you know those shows where there's like like, yeah, there's obviously shows where there's people that bought tickets. And there's obviously shows where we're interrupting bingo. You know, it was just like, <laughs> oh, there's like 10 people with their backs turned who just fucking don't want you there. And for some reason, uh, like, hell yeah, let's have a death metal show. You guys could drive from eight states away for the, you know. Uh, this was one of those really weird ones. It was a combination where the people whose bingo game we're interrupting or whatever were there in the midst of 200 people. But those are the people whose drinks turf just Boot right. into the ceiling and like I, like that turned so fucking weird yeah sorry your story reminded me of that story <laughs> yeah um we had to be protected we were in protective custody in block b it's weird <laughs> it's weird that the venue security would even protect us because literally we were the assholes i mean granted like the audience a lot they're you know they seemed poorly educated they seemed rednecky <laughs> they wanted to hear skinnered but but we were egging them on like like yeah. whenever Swisher was around, it, like we were egging everyone on, and it's like, man, what a strange career move to be like. Okay, we kicked this guy out of the band once. Let's hire him again years later. 
as as a let's hire him as a saxophone player, even though he just started playing the saxophone. Why not? You know? Wait, what was he before? Was he the- He was the original drummer. He's actually oh, pre- was he? okay. he's actually a pretty decent drummer. So he, we did an album with him in 02. And we so we started the band in 01. We played a bunch of shows with Swisher as a drummer, 02, and 03. And then we fired him in 04 because he actually like he got in this crazy fight with his girlfriend at the time at this um we were supposed to play this devil's night party in this really gnarly neighborhood in Detroit. And it was just it was like it was some like Sid and Nancy shit. And we're Was just, it in Ham Ham Tramp? No, no, it was actually oh. Detroit. It was on the east side. Uh, it was oh, called okay. it was called Richie's Ballroom, and this was uh, this was Devil's Night of two thousand and three, and and we, we okay. and it was like just some Sid and Nancy shit that was like really embarrassing, and then we couldn't play the gig be- because of him. So we were like, all right, and then and then, well, long story short, his brother in like oh six uh, or like oh five, his brother committed suicide, and he started playing the saxophone shortly afterwards, and he, you know, we reconnected, and he gave me this. This kind of like I'm changed, I'm different. You know, my my brother passed away, and I'm a different person. But what was really weird is the more comfortable he got, his brother passing away turned into this excuse for him to like eat a bunch of pills and drink and drink as much booze as possible and make every single person around us like as uncomfortable. Like, cause it, it went from the point where it was like, oh, this is fu- this is funny. We're messing with people. We're jokesters. To to people were legitimately like feeling unsafe and having their feelings hurt because he was around. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're, that's the thing. He was a, he was kind of a tough guy too. So like people, I mean, anyone can make certain people uncomfortable. Like l- l- any male human being can make almost any female human being yeah. pretty afraid. Yeah. But like he could make like me and Casago and kind of like, Oh, he's going off a little. Let's, uh, why don't we just back into the kitchen of this party for a while while he's over there? Right. But, uh, he he has, he's got these like this kind of like borderline like sociopathic streak where he'll 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 do things and laugh about them that I say he's got issues. I haven't talked to him in over a decade. I don't know how he's doing. He like I just hope he is off drugs and he's you know trying to be a better person. That's all. But I, but I, 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 I will not let that person back into my life, dude. No way, not in a million years. Sorry, dude. Anyway, <laughs> let's let's talk about let's talk about something uh, like uh, on a lighter note. So your anxiety. Let's right. let's go into that. <laughs> I want to tell you about my mental problems. Tell me about your mental problems because I because I saw a video on TikTok where you're you're on meds. I I, w- I recently went on meds uh, again, but on again, off again. But um, yeah. But it says something about like. You know, your hands were kind of shaky playing the keyboard. Like, do you do you care going into all that? Any of that? Because oh yeah, no, I will. I, well, yeah, because it's 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 kind of interesting. I, I some of this is just my own random conjecture, but um, I think I've always had you know a certain amount of anxiety. I actually could probably pinpoint a lot of the things. Like uh, me too. I, I would say for sure, and I haven't really talked to my doctor about this in particular because this is kind of a new experiment. I have a really cool right. uh, primary care guy that I finally got. Like we were like talking about beavers and butthead and stuff. He's probably our age, you know. Um, yeah, except he went to really, med school. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing, though. I'm like, I have realized in the in the medical world that there's people who are good at school that have attentive parents that want the best for them and they have money. And sometimes those people become doctors. Right. And sometimes there's really, 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 really smart people and they become doctors. Right. And these are two (laughs) very different fucking kinds of doctor. You're like, well, they're a doctor, right? I'm like, "Uh, yeah, but my old doc Leonard, uh, my guy, who's that's why I call that. He's probably like six months younger than me, but old doc Leonard uh, is, is the latter. He is, he seems to be just a very wise and rational guy that's like, I'm going to go into medicine. Like, okay. Um, yeah. So anyway, that's why I finally, I've never had a regular doctor until like now, pretty much. Isn't that funny? So he started kind of being like, you live like this. <laughs> yeah, and like, he right. actually did blood work on me and stuff. And, you know, Alexis was just like, went with me to my first one. And she was just like, I would really like you to just, whatever we could test John for, he's never really had a lot of like, you know, whatever. Like, it, is my liver hanging by a thread? Yeah, full. It pa- it's called the full panel. They gave you the full yeah. panel. Yeah, we had EKGs on and stuff. Like, they're like, let's see. And and uh, damn, I gotta try to tell this story in the right order. 
basically, I've probably always had pretty strong anxiety and, and medicated it with booze and drugs. That's definitely like a big part of who I am. Same. Like my, my only handbrake was being like, if I bought some Xanax off of some MILF I was banging or something, be, okay, <laughs> like I can, I can slow this down a little. Um, but it got basically once I got kind of more stable and became a homeowner, like I've been with Alexis for years now and she's like really smart, really, f- I mean, she's the co-host of the podcast. Okay. And, you know, she's really great. She has like a real job <clears throat> in like a hospital and everything. And we're like, okay, like their parents are cool. And uh, so my normal anxiety that, you know, you would see occasionally and sometimes would come out in my temper a bit. I kind of worked on it. And so I started having actual panic attacks, like those things where you think you're having a heart attack and just oh, yeah. lucky for me, Alexis works in the cardiology department of a, of a hospital and she was like, John, it's not a heart. It's, it was like three in the morning. I wake her up. She's like, you're not having a heart attack. These people who are having heart attacks. Don't run around screaming that they're having a heart attack. <laughs> like they, they like, oh, like they can't, <clears throat> you know, it's like, you're barely hanging on. You're having a panic attack. That's what that is. Like, but my arm's numb. It's like, yeah, a lot of things are happening with you. This is a panic attack. Um, so that finally kind of for is a little while ago now, finally kind of forced me to be like, I need to go to a doctor and really see what the fuck this is. And I talked to him once. We kind of ruled out a bunch of physical stuff. And he was like, you would do really well probably with therapy. I think you have generalized anxiety disorder. So eventually he was like, I I went back. There's like a long waiting list to get in with a therapist and all that. He's like, okay, for right now, he's like, I am not a Pez dispenser pill doctor, but I think we're going to try putting you on a low dose of Cymbalta and see like what that does for you. And yeah, that helped a lot. Like I complete, I just sleep. I was getting like, Hitler fucking 45 bombing Berlin. <laughs> like just, I'm like, Oh, I'm getting older and they, they're gone. Like, he's like, Oh, I just sleep now. Yeah, like, I just go to bed and I stay asleep and all that stuff. But, but that the video I made in particular, I guess, um, people are like, there's side effects for the first month or two. Like it, you'll, you'll be less panicky, but you'll feel like you're on drugs. You'll feel weird. And I looked up how it worked and kind of what people talk about. And I realized, thankfully, that I had done so many drugs in the past. I was like, oh, this is a thing that that messes with the way that serotonin in your brain works. And so is Molly. And these weird, like, waves I feel through my body and these kind of strange, like, oh, this feels like I'm coming up on kind of a weak Molly trip. <laughs> oh, that's all it is? Okay. I had to talk to my doctor and be like, listen, I've done a lot of drugs. Because he's like, if the side effects get too bad, call me. And I'm like, how do I know if they're bad? And he's like, oh, yeah. Uh, and I'm like, would I, would I, should I be able to drive on this? Even like right away when it's a little rough, he's like, yeah, if you can't drive, it's too much. Like if you can get behind <laughs> the wheel still, you're, you're actually fine. Like whatever. I'm like, okay, good. That's a good litmus test. Cool. Uh, cause I was like, um, you know, seeing your dead grandmother crawl up your leg with a knife in her teeth. I'm like, well that, yeah, maybe I didn't get enough sleep. I don't know. That happens. I've done a lot of LSD. He's like, okay, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we kind of worked that out. And, um, it, but I was like, I would get kind of shaky. I'd be kind of like, I'd like nod off and then get kind of wired. And I, it, it was very druggy. That's why I made that video uh, because I tested myself being like, will, can I play the keyboard without my hands shaking? And the answer is yes. So that means that my body wasn't convulsing. It's like someone who had a stroke or something. It's like, Oh, that's, that part of your brain is a different part of your brain than the hanging around brain, you know? So it's like, if I could just do everything I would normally do musically without shaking, that just means that I'm having, you know, it's, it's, it's getting me kind of nervous and excited and weird. But when the, but the, the other part of my nervous system just locks in when I play music, I'm probably okay. And, and then again, I'm very okay with being like public with all that stuff because it's, I think very obvious that I'm an insane person. Like I'm going to go back and talk about how, I probably also have a touch of ADD. We probably both do. And I definitely have hypomania. That that thing where when people come from rich families, they end up being like CEOs of things because you get into these three week long, like that's where I'm like writing a whole remix album for some other band in like four days that they'd be right. like, this is really cool. And I'd be like, I don't want to talk for a week. Like, well, that's <laughs> hypomania. But we haven't even gotten into that. I was just like, these panic attacks need to stop. And I got to get back with them and be like, hey, this actually helped. Uh, there's some other things though, because I did have, and you know, maybe this is obvious right now, but 
it, my concern was the the overclocked engine was where my ideas come from. Like the thing that gives me the panic attacks is also where my creativity comes from. Yeah. So I had this fear that I'm like, and that was kind of true for the first month. Like I just didn't make any of those weird YouTube videos. I kind of banked a few podcasts, but like those weird on the green screen and stuff. I was like, I can't write all this dialogue and just do all this shit. And I was afraid that that would be forever because I'm like the same thing that, that I wake up screaming after an hour of sleep and then I can't sleep might be also where just the wild ideas came from. And I'm like, right. damn. But I did level off to where I've been, yeah, I've been writing new ones of those are going to happen. TikTok was actually almost also a bit of a, uh, what do I want to say, therapeutic thing I came up with for myself. I'm like, I'm going to force myself to try to be funny and interesting on this thing that I haven't done before. I don't know how the interface works. Yeah. I'm going to learn it. I'm going to try to be funny on it. I'm going to try to get attention on it because if I can do that, then my fears are not true. Then, then yes. Then obviously in little steps, that part of my brain, I didn't want to lose is still functioning. So I'm like, oh, I'm being silly on here and I can come up with brand new stupid ideas. But yeah, there was about a month there where I was like, damn, I'm kind of shaky. Just kind of get tired really early. I fucking, I'm not really having any big, crazy ideas. Does this just turn me into a cog? Or should I just go get, some regional manager IT position somewhere yeah. and just be like, well, yeah, it's not so bad. Like, you know, I'm just going to maybe come home and see the wife and that'll be all I do until I die. But, but after about a month and a half, I'm like, Oh, I got ideas again, baby. Yeah. Uh, but I'm just not freaked out. So it's weird. There That's is, good. Kind of balance me out. Uh, hats off to doc later for prescribing me the right thing on the first try. Yeah. Now is Cymbalta an SSRI? It's the other one. It's the SNRI. Okay. It's, it, it, it like, it, to be honest, I, I've been reading what the difference is and I can never like remember. Neither. Ne- I don't out. remember either. I'm on an SSRI, uh, okay, uh Lexapro. Yeah. And so, yeah, similarly, it was one of those things where I wasn't on it from, I stopped taking it in 2012. And when the pandemic hit, I just got really depressed. And I, I don't know if you've seen Bo Burnham's new special, but it actually gave me like pandemic, uh, kind of like PTSD, like watching it because I'm like, oh shit, like he, like I was there. I was there like the su- suicidal ideations and the fucking yeah. anger and, and the just like the hopelessness and not showering. And yeah, because because uh, everything I had in California when the pandemic hit was just kind of ripped away from me. I really had the only outlet I had was like going for a walk every day and like making fucking YouTube videos, which actually like I think added to my, my mental fucking problems because i was making like some of it was like political based and like trying to be humorous yeah. but but it, and it was a new thing for me too like i'm like all right i'm just going to be a content machine and and then i started placing my self-worth like based on whether or not it performed well and started judging myself really yeah. harshly <laughs> and then came the hate comments and yada yada and i just got uh, like yeah i had to go back go back on ssri just because it pretty much was it was like okay am i gonna want to wake up and wanting to die every day or am I going to take these fucking pills and see if they helped? And yeah, it was a little shaky first month, but eventually, yeah, it just evened out and didn't, didn't even feel like now life feels kind of like normal. And and I've been pretty productive too, so I don't know. It's it's no, not- that's always good to see. Yeah, I don't I don't think I don't think you have to be miserable to make interesting art. I think you probably need to have come from a not bad even necessarily, although sometimes, but you know, a tumultuous background to give you perspective. Right. Like I think, you know, travel, not having everything, you know, you know, not just get you, you, your, your biggest stress in life is, do I take the, my, the, the job at my dad's company? I don't really know. And it's like, you know, if you ever have to like kind of fight for your meals a little bit, you know, I, I think that's all it takes. I don't think you have to be perpetually miserable. Right. Like I think as an adult, you could draw from all the bullshit that you remember and, and kind of learn, you know, that the world's kind of a, a scam and that it's our job to make fun of that and, and you know, whatever. And I don't, I don't, but I, yeah, it's definitely okay to be able to sleep at night and feel level and then be creative and then be like, no, I'm going to make, you know, crazy music and, and, and fucked up videos. And, and uh, it's not mutually exclusive to actually right. be okay. And then be interesting. also. <laughs> yeah. And for the longest time I was like, I was like, yeah, all like, there's enough, co- like, it, it, yeah, it took me to get to come to the conclusion that there's enough collective misery in my past. Uh, yeah. It's okay for me to actually be in a good place. And, and it's weird because I'm in like 
the best place I've ever been. Like I have a house with uh, my girlfriend's really nice. I have like a whole fucking studio. I I can make all types of cool videos. Um, like I'm making music with my band again. I'm close to my mom. My mom's still alive. She like had three brain surgeries in 2017. So it's so like there were so many things to be grateful for. But it's 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 wild when you're in that state where you're just like okay. I can look at all these positive things and I can use that to propel me positively forward or I could just concentrate on the things I don't have, on the things that didn't yeah. turn out the way I wanted them to. I can compare myself to other people and then I could just like look in the mirror and tell myself I'm ugly and then I can just reverberate my dead father's voice in my head on a perpetual cycle, you know? And, then, and those are the things I would do instead of be like, well, I have all this nice shit, you know? So... Good for yeah. That's what I, that's what I did. Alexis and I call it the gratitude. You just, I think that's from I think it's from Big Mouth that cartoon. But I, uh, I haven't seen it yet. Oh gosh, Neil, it's uh, one of those weird gosh. things where it, it only keeps getting funnier. Like okay. I mean, it'll it'll probably hit a slump, but it's been three seasons and the they've only gotten more ridiculous. But anyway, whatever you got the time, but. Uh, yeah, just the, just, we always say, remember the gratitude. So remember, it's like, Hey, we have a house. Like we have cars that work. Like nobody out there is trying to kill us. Like, this is great. Like we kind of have the, the groundwork to be able to do whatever we want. Like she actually enjoys her job. Yeah. Like, you know, I enjoy what I do again. Like, I mean, she makes more money than me, but like the money I do make comes from doing stuff that I like, feel like I'm good at. And I mean, you know, annoying clients with dumb ideas is one thing, but it beats the fuck out of like, you know, like, oh, uh, uh, you, you don't have 14 pieces of flair on your uniform. Those are supposed to show that you're fun. Like not yeah. having to have a morning meeting ever again. Well, it, unless I really fuck up and just have to go back to that. But for now, anyway, like that's plenty. Like it, it, falling short of international rock sensation for me is fine. As long as like, yeah, but I don't have to work at Walmart. So I mean, and God bless anyone that does have to do that. But just me being like, yo, I'm, I'm the lights are on and I'm not there. Like for yeah. me, that's like, that's good enough. I'll take that all day long. And, uh, but yeah, a little, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of Buddhism and mushrooms and things and all of that. You know, just be, just appreciate where you are now. Exactly. Cause now it isn't going to be there in a year. And, and that's the other thing too, is I don't <laughs> like, I'm trying to put my finger on what, was it like was it early sort of success and opportunities with the whole rock and roll thing that like really convinced me that I, like that I was owed some sort of you know some sort of fucking pot of gold at the end of that fucking rainbow? I mean, did, did you go yeah. did you go through a similar mindset like when you were doing big gigs like opening up for mindless self indulgence and stuff and that was in like the mid two thousands? Where did you convince yourself that yo yo this is going to work? Yo, this is the ticket. Did did you have some a similar conversation with yourself? Because I certainly oh, did. Um, I will say yes with a with a little plus sign after it, which is <laughs> I thought that the second that I started because okay, so like I yeah, well, I actually was kind of a confident I was like a weird goth kid, but I was I didn't really have a confidence problem. It wasn't like, oh, the jocks are all like I'm like, nah, they're fine. They like me. Right. I don't know. Like I, I was like weird leather pants guy. <laughs> in high school like just being and i was like a little too fat for him and just i didn't care like, I just be like yeah I, what, I got like the dreadlocks when i was like 16 or something like that and kid back in those days were like you someone let you do that <laughs> like we all have crew cuts like what the fuck I'm like yeah man i just do whatever i want and they're like oh that's cool so part of like <laughs> part of that whole the, the world owes me something is i learned how to get attention beyond my scope even before music i that you know talk you know you're making me think and realize that maybe just right now that being able to go oh you're supposed to get picked on because you're wearing a Marilyn manson shirt and like you don't play football and stuff even though the size wise i probably should have been playing football i don't know but like it, it, it was like oh but i can just get girls to pay attention to me by doing like the morning video announcements and just making scary garbage on there and it, it, whatever like I, I figured out how to manipulate like in that well, like not to but you know light side of the force but almost in that trump way of just being like i don't give a fuck you want to be like me and not give a fuck 
like I learned that a little early and then I started doing band and I was like, Oh, this is just going to be a slam dunk until I'm like you know, the size of Pantera or something. Yeah. Like that's how <laughs> this is going to work out. Matter of fact, musical efficacy didn't even like I learned as I went, but I wasn't one of those kids that took piano lessons or anything. Right. And you know, people that really know what they're doing tend to have a bit of a better shot, but I was all like, whatever. Like, I just, I just know I got this and I'll figure out how to write songs good enough and wear a dress on stage and just terrorize <laughs> people into, into paying attention to me. And the thing is, that's where the caboose does link up with the rest of the train of that thought of like, that is where some of the early success came from because there was probably people far more deserving of positive attention in the early, you know, like early college, late high school, little world of all ages music or whatever. There was probably people more deserving that we were like out drawing because I was such a lunatic. And then I started collecting like Cass and Brian and people who were actually really good musicians yeah. and who were like, yeah, I'm down. And we were, our, our hair matched our weird clothes. And, you know, and we just started being insane. And it was only a few years until we could draw 400 kids to an all ages thing. And then like a couple of years after that, we were opening for MSI. So if you were like, if you were making a graph, you wouldn't be that stupid to be like, oh, from 16 when you figured out how to get laid all the way up until like right after the MSI tour and all that stuff, you know, from 96 to 2006 or whatever, that you were just on this path of like, everyone wants a piece of you. You're doing it, baby. You're just rattling that cage and pissing people off, but more people like you than hate you. So it's going to fucking kind of work out where you never get beat up or jailed and it's just going to be okay. And then, yeah, it really only like becomes that grind of like, oh, but you forgot there's kids whose parents will like buy them on Ozpessy now you have to compete with. And you guys are going through your 15th broken fan in a row. People are starting to quit and get replaced. Things are just like, you're getting a little tired. Your back hurts. You're like, Duh. and like, but I, I don't think you or I are ever truly delusional. If you really look at the data, like a scientist and going, yeah, but the trajectory sort of says this could have worked. It did. It did. And it's that's just really hard. And, and you know, the, you pull back and you're like, yeah, but no one ever makes it. And there's a lot of survivorship bias of like all my favorite bands that are famous dicked around for three years and got a big record deal. Like, all right, that must be how it works. Yeah. And you don't know the 500,000 that you've never heard of. Right. Tried, so you don't have all the data, but when you're looking at what you're doing and you're looking at what you have grown up looking at what they did, you're like, well, this matches. So why would this not work? You'd be like weird to think that it was going to fail. Being mm -hmm. realistic would have actually been sort of unscientific when you're in the eye of a hurricane like that. Like it, yeah, now we can look back and be like, oh, we were missing a huge data set here. <laughs> like of like what yeah, the yeah. odds are and all that and how much money it fucking takes and how much you get out of it. And that all matters. Because, you know, probably, again, too, money wasn't even you or I. Like, yeah, well, whatever. Broke anyway, so fuck it. Exactly. Like, let's just go. We just need to make sure we have amps at work and shit. And you know, we'll figure that out. Like, But it, it, the, the point was the attention and the chaos and the fame and the travel and the whatever, but it wasn't like, well, okay. And uh, this year we put 30,000 away and I'm going to invest 10 of that because I can live off this. And then I'm going to do it. Yeah. I didn't think like that till no. like four years ago. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Like what's crazy is looking back at my, uh, my W twos for like the last three years and realizing that I, I made more money on paper. Like, the less I was involved in music <laughs> than, than, I, than I ever did when I was like truly, truly involved, you know? Um, but yeah, what you were saying too is, yeah, there was a little bit of cogniz involved, but honestly, we wouldn't have kept pushing so hard if we didn't keep like surpassing our expectations every fucking year. Like it, it went from... It went from like, okay, we're playing in a basement and there's a backyard wrestling party upstairs to, okay, we're, <laughs> we're, we drew 200 people to the shelter to we, okay, we just drew 300 people to Smalls uh, or uh, no, it was, it was Alvin's in 04. Mm. Okay, we're opening up for the Aquabats. Okay, we're opening up for all these big bands. Okay, we're touring now. Okay, um, these kids are going nuts in these cities and these kids are going nuts in these cities. We're selling lots of merchandise. Okay, our numbers are up on MySpace. This is working. And yeah. but but yeah, like what yeah, the other data sets. So the the biggest fucking light bulb that went off in my head was when I was talking to the bass player of Fishbone. Uh, who was managing our band at the time. And I remember I was at my catering job and I was talking to him and he says, yeah, I'm at my 
my I'm painting houses. And I was thinking to myself, why? You're you what you're painting your own house? He's like, no, I'm painting houses like to make money. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, this dude's in Fishbone. This legend the legendary band Fishbone. Yeah. That they got signed to a major label, like right out of high school. They all were 17, 18 years old, like right out of high school, got signed to Columbia Records. They made a, a record with David Kahn, who produced Paul fucking McCartney. And flash forward however many years later these dudes have fucking side hustles, side gigs. They have regular ass jobs just to supplement their income because being in a legendary band like Fishbone is is not enough to fucking pay nine dudes mortgage. Not, you know what I mean? And that is yep. that is the reality. That is the reality of it. Is is the fact is even if you reach that pinnacle of quote success, you get that major label deal. It doesn't really necessarily mean you're taken care of. You know, and I, yep. and, and that's when it really hit me. It's like, oh shit. I'm going to be poor until I'm dead. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that gets, that gets less fun as you get older to like that. I mean, like I don't blame anyone who's like, yo, I need to get, I need to get shit straightened out here Yeah, because it's like being 19 and uncomfortable, whatever, but being 58 right. and miserably uncomfortable is like, dude, I can't sleep on a floor. Like my back, you know, like you just can't do it anymore. And you're like, well, what if you start needing insulin or something? You got to. And that's like shitty. I guess that's on God. Like, well, this is bullshit. Fuck you. And also like, you know, if not for the the heart of rock and roll is in the blues. And if not for the struggle, I mean, I guess what's even the point. But I just think that like I have some I'm not bitter at all about anything that I've done or like music in and of itself and whatever. But I do. When I like to share a light bulb moment, it wasn't exactly because I started doing pretty good from the like, video and production side hustle. Right. Actually, well before I stopped and I was okay. able to get away with a lot. But but when I just realized how predatory and zero sum the music like here's what I, here's my light bulb. My light bulb in complete nutshell is um, I realized I didn't want to even be kind of successful. Like I like to be happy and it's kind of exactly like yours where I was like, huh. I don't want to go through like, yeah, there's, there's 400 people at, even on a Wednesday at, 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 in Nebraska, like at every single gig, blah, 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 blah. And they're like screaming your name and all that stuff. And you, you guys made a thousand dollars tonight or that probably more than that. But it, if it's that, but it, like, I was like that best case scenario, good Lord willing and the Creek don't rise and everything goes even how I want it to go. I still have to go through that, which sounds like an amazing thing to like 19 year old me. And I'm like, dude, I don't want to do that. Like, I don't <laughs> even want to like rent a bus with a driver and do like, I'm like, when, that's when I realized, oh, wait, this isn't sparking joy. Like when I went like, yeah, play yeah. like the triple rock packed every night. I'm like, yeah, but that's still just like bullshit. And I'm not even to that. So I was like, I don't want to go through the middle part of this, even if I keep trying and anything did work. And, you know, like, like uh, for, to be like an arena band, which, by the way, is, you know, it's never going to happen also. But I was like, even like a cool retirement punk rock career of like, hey, the 7th Street Entry or somewhere like that. Or the, the Magic Stick kind of has a lot of people in it or whatever all around the country. It's like in some places in Europe. And it's like, yeah, we're doing OK. And then we work the rest of the year. I'm like, I'm just going to work for the whole year. Fuck all this. Like, I'm completely done. Like it didn't even sound appealing to be anything other than an arena band that's like on a check. I was like, and if that means I don't really <laughs> want to do it, is what that means. It means that I was that I would have loved that 15 years ago. But then it's like I think stability outweighs even the hey, you guys are doing pretty good, dream, you know, like, like hey. And that's, you know, other friends of mine, like the last two guys that were in my zero, the last thing I did are still pandemic ended. And they're like, yeah, we're gonna do our east coast thrash punk metal thing with goofy fucking samples in it and we're gonna we're gonna play to 10 people at this laundromat here we go and they're my age i'm like right wow you guys still want to do that that is i love you and that's good and they have real jobs too on this i mean whatever but i'm like i bravo because they like talking about guitar pedals with other guys i just don't care they're like it got this great i'll show up to some of these because i love you but this sucks. I don't want this to be my life. <laughs> I don't want to lift another kick drum into a car. Like I just like, and if I truly loved it, I would love that too. I'd be like, fuck yeah. All five people, four of them kind of paid attention. This was the shit. I'm like, no, like <laughs> anything less than 4,000. And I don't care. So I'm like, so I'm done. That means that I hate this. 
and I'm clinging to something because it's part of my identity and I need to let it die and I need to just go have fun doing some other garbage, which for me is video stuff and comedy. Yeah, but, and, you're, and you're good at it too. I, like I, I definitely was lurking on your TikTok page and and your your writing is concise and and you can like you said something about not understanding the format but you it seems like you have a firm grasp of it because it's just like it's quick little bits quick little jokes and then and then you you, like i don't know if you use after effects because like i'm a premiere guy i don't know what you use to do all your like video effects but like even even in the when i first saw you were starting to like put out music videos for other people i was just like wow he's like really fucking good at this shit you know so, so yeah, well, I, I think it. I think there's potential there, and, and and yeah, and also with the onset of the well, I love TikTok, by the way, it grew yeah. on me. Like I, love oh yeah, it it's super fucking. I'm like talking to all these kids. It reminds me of being in a band in 2005. Yeah, like I'm just like they're like, hey, this is really funny. You know what else? Blah blah. blah. I'm like, yeah, man, that's right. Fuck those guys. Like it gives me that little feeling just on my phone, <laughs> like from <Yeah>. work. <laughs> yeah, and those those little shits, those zoomers are. They're not very much different than what we were in 05, you know, 04, when, when we were little shits as well. It's just the landscape is just different, you know? I think there's more people like this might be a weird just statistical bias or something, but I, I actually kind of feel I like I have a, like a, the kids are all right feeling sort of. Yeah, obviously there's lots of people there. It's all over the place. But I feel like there's more kids that would have been like us that exist now at that age I agree. than there were when we were that age. I agree. Like there's more angry little like, hey, do you know that everything's a scam? And I'm like, it sure is, little guy. Stick it to the man. <laughs> like, there's just more of that. And they're all like, fuck this. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Like, that's right. Guy. And that's, I think that's part of the fun is just reconnecting with people who are like, hey, you know, you and I, it wasn't all for nothing. It's like, oh, there's more kids like this now. Like, yeah. whatever we had a small part in, kind of took hold in the zeitgeist just a little bit and it's like everybody's a little bit less willing to just go along with being used and everything just you know, everything just being this crappy sort of like yeah you just get in line whatever they're like i'm not getting like what is this this just making someone else rich fuck this like there's yeah. more of that i think that's super fucking great and so that's kind of why i like there being an app where i'm like hey grandpa's gonna tell you some stories <laughs> yeah and, well and that's essentially what I do on there is I'm just like, yeah, there was this one time I did this. There's one time I did that. And those, those videos actually do pretty well for me, but it, there definitely is like, a, as far as the sense of humor, there's like a nihilistic f- sense mm-hmm. of, of dread for that. The zoomers have. And I actually, so the last relationship I was in before the, like the, the relationship I'm in now, which it, yeah. it, like she's age appropriate. I definitely like the girl I dated before my current girlfriend was, she was a little too young. And, but, but that's where I kind of learned she, I mean, she was 23 when I started dating her, and uh, but she had this like really fatalistic, like fucking hopeless sense of humor where she just joked about killing herself and she, everything is fucking terrible. Ooh, that's that's a little. I was gonna say Alexis is a you know a bit younger than me. She's right. 28, but um, or 27. Sorry, uh, but she's also like fully like drives a 2021 car, like real medical job. Like right. she's more grown up than me in a way, but. We are like lockstep in our love of nonsense. It's literally why she helps work on the YouTube channel. And is, I don't mean to cut off the point you were making. Just when you were saying that, I was like, she's like positive, but in that still like, yeah, fuck everything. Like it would right. be cool if this person that was a bitch got punched in the face. Like I, I love it, it. We connect on that weird level where it does work that like, she's like, I, I don't know where it's going with that, but just, just that, just that rowdy, kind of like connection though you'd think that we'd have nothing to talk about after that first three months of hooking up that turned into more than six years and owning a house together well it's nice <laughs> it's well and that's the other thing too is I, I remember i used to think um about relationships and about being attracted to people like so one of the main things if i met a girl that like mr bungle i was like oh she's perfect and you you get to a certain age and you realize that like having similar interests doesn't really fucking matter it's like your ability to communicate with a human being uh you know empathy comes into play uh yeah. maturity and there's a there's a whole lot of shit that has nothing to do with whether or not i mean like my girlfriend i don't know we listen to some of the same music but she's like really obsessed with like dua lipa right now and uh a a lot of this hyper pop stuff i like some of it but she's like really into 
like really gay stuff. <laughs> and, yeah. And uh, and that's not necessarily my, as far as music is concerned, it's not super my cup of tea, but I'm like, she's not really in it. You know, but it doesn't matter. Like ultimately what it comes down to is like, she has a great sense of humor. We work really well together. She, yeah. she busts her ass. She like, she, she's got a lot going on. She has her own business. She's killing it. Like, nice. like, yeah, it, it, it's, it's great. But, but back to, <laughs> but back to my ex, like r- really, I didn't understand zoomer humor. I would always just be like, I would always be like, are you okay? Like you're talking about all this stuff and you're talking about killing yourself all the time. She's like, I'm just joking. And I, and I would be like, like it took, it took for me really to get on TikTok to be like, oh, it's an entire generation of people that literally are looking around and they're just like, this fucking sucks. And this is terrible. Yeah. And we're going to just make memes about it, you know? <laughs> Well, there, there are a generation of people that not only can see through everything to how crappy it is, but they're also, you know, everyone is still trying to lie to them. Right. And so I think that's where that really comes. Cause they're like, well, this is all bullshit. And they're like, no, dude, get just a hundred thousand dollars for college and, and whatever. And they're like, we know already from the internet that we're going to do that and then not get a job. We're going to yeah. get like a minimum wage. Job. They're like, so no, it's like, this fear and loathing like of them being like, Oh, this is a fucking nightmare. But then like the neon cowboys to like, eh, 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 right. eh, in their face, <laughs> like, oh, Whoa, like this. Okay. This is, you guys are in charge. Like this just horse shit. It's like, whatever. So like, of course that's our sense of humor. And they're like, right. Oh yeah. This is fucking like smiling Pee Wee Herman guys. Like get, get in line kids do everything right. And we're like, why is everything like behind you on fire? It's like, Oh, what are you a lip tart? Move out of the way. Like, right. <laughs> yeah, those guys aren't going to buy anything. Anyone's selling them ever again because of that. And God, though, that's tragic. But I do love that about them. That they, I just love watching them go. No, what? Like, cause that's how I, and you probably always felt <laughs> like, yeah. oh, thank you. We're not crazy. Are we like no. all of our favorite comedians weren't wrong. Well, our favorite bands weren't wrong. Like, no. It's all a fucking joke. Yeah. But, it's, it's like when you get old enough uh, to realize that all the Dead Kennedys lyrics were right, you know, yeah. about everything. Because, <laughs> you know, back because back in the day, I'm listening to all this shit just because I, I like the music and I like the spirit of it. But to, but to actually, yeah. once you get to a point in your life where you actually know what they're talking about and you actually are, are like, you know, you're just like, oh, shit. Like this was way on point, and it's weird too, because like that's a lot of that stuff was written in the '80s, and it's still happening this day. Like I was talking to, to Norwood of Fishbone about because they have a lot of songs that are, you know, they discuss systemic racism and whatnot. And, yeah. And I remember asking them during the George Floyd shit, just just being like, "Well, how do y'all feel knowing that you wrote these songs that have these lyrics?" And we, I actually read some of the lyrics on the podcast, and I'm like, "This is still happening." And he, and I, I like I can't really paraphrase his reaction, but they're not stoked about it. Let's just put no, it that know, way. If you were, if you wrote songs in the early '80s, being like this is fucked, and you're like, oh, and, and like it was 30, 40 years later, you're like, oh, this is just still happening. Yeah, that's not something yeah. to get stoked on. And that, I think that was because I always knew the Dead Kennedys were as zany as it was. Like I always took it as like. Oh, that was happening then though. They're serious about that. Yeah. But the thing that I realized, like, oh no, that never stopped. Yeah. <laughs> we just became slightly more aware of it now, or at least more people per capita did. But it was like, oh yeah, yeah, this is how this is how police brutality works. This is how this is and yeah, yeah. Which, by the way, yeah, the George Floyd stuff that happened four miles from my house. <laughs> like, yeah, you want to get into that whoa. a little bit? Because I talk I talked to Cass briefly after all of that happened, but then he got he had all those personal things happen with his fiance and stuff. I, I don't, and I haven't got an update on that. I don't know. I haven't talked to him since then. Really. I hope he's doing okay. Well, we all hope. Um, but yeah, uh, that was really wild because, um, my buddy David lives, the guy, uh, the bass player in my zero who was an SMB at the very end. He lives like a bought house a while ago. Uh, like walking distance from the police station that got burnt down. Yeah. Which by the way, is still as terrifying as that was to be near that is still one of my favorite. Like I want to get a blown up picture from the uh, star tribune or whatever the people on like the police station on fire and just put like, you can't fight city hall and then put it in a frame in my 
bar upstairs or something like that. <laughs> like, I just, I love that around it just where all your base are belong to us or some shit. I don't know. Just some, I want a big, beautiful print of that. Cause it's like, you know, it was terrifying at the time, but still just being like, okay. Like you didn't go, Oh, you know, the cops shot somebody. Let's throw a brick through the window of a hardware Hank. Like, no, they went and burned that police station that that guy worked for down. Yeah. Like that is like, cause I, okay, look, man, I drive a Prius. I am a very progressive lefty guy, but there does get to be living around here. A certain point where the blue hairs are getting a little bit like, I'm like, okay, like, I, I had somebody be like, what we should be doing is burning down all the houses, like on the, uh, you know, in that part of uptown on the lake over there, like the nice houses. And I'm like, you know, that's, um, I was like at a thing. And like, you know, like Alexis's parents live in one of those. Like, oh, what do they do? It's like, well, her dad is like the head of the nurses union at the uh, Abbott Northwestern Hospital. So he's a union organizer. Right. And he's a labor guy and yeah. a nurse that like helps people. Like you're going to burn like, well, maybe that's the exception. Like, but if you hadn't heard this from me, that's just what you would have done. And that would have like fixed the cops. Like that's, it's like, I think you're bored. And I think that you just want to solve your problems by throwing a rock at whatever's right in front of you. And I get that that's all you can do sometimes, but it's also like when I, when all that was going on, I, I, I was like, I did feel pride because people were in this big, you know, of course, Maybe it's not the right thing to do. I don't know. But they fought the police. Like, yeah. they didn't go like, oh, fuck anybody who's upper middle class, except for our parents, because they live way out in the suburbs, but don't tell anyone on the internet. Like, oh, okay. right. but these guys burnt down the police station, right. flip cop cars. They were just like, fuck, they backed them down. Like, I was like, that is, cr- I, you know, I was dealing with an injury. And even still, it's like pushing 40. I'm like, these kids are like 18. This is not my gig to like run out there. With. Yeah. I was trying to share anything I could on the internet. Of course. I was like, yeah. dude, God bless you guys for doing what you're doing here because I fucking, I'm old and I can't, but like, <laughs> same dude. It was, it was, it was wild. And I came close. I will tell you that. Oh, right. Cause David though, he lives, him and his lady live around the corner. Like you could walk to where that place is on fire. There's like gas mains I thought would blow up. But what he saw, and this almost got me out of the house, even though I could barely get up and down stairs at the time. Uh, I am, you know, a lefty guy, but also a legal, cautious and well-trained gun owner. And David was like, there are guys with no license plates on their pickup trucks in red hats, like pushing around women in head coverings, like in the street out here. They're like driving oh, it. Wow. Like that thing about people coming in from other states to like agitate, like big white slabs of pork in a fucking ha- camo hat or a mega hat or something right. like driving in and like daddy's $200,000 black lifted pickup truck thing to go like raise hell or whatever. And David's like, I'm not like, I lived a little further out. It was kind of quiet where I was. Like I lived a little closer to the mall of America at the time. I'm actually born in the city right now where I bought a house, but this is before that. But I came pretty close to being like, you know what? This is what I was, this is what I was waiting for. I'm going to take my fucking AK-47 that I built on a kit part. <laughs> I'm going to drive my Prius <laughs> to David's house. I'm going to post <laughs> up on the porch. And if I see someone shoving around like a tattooed lesbian or someone of color, I am just going to smoke them with this thing that I fucking should not be able to own and bought just because I can, because I have that Hunter Thompson gene in me. And I'm like, oh, that's what's going that one. It should be mounted <laughs> to a helicopter. You shouldn't be able to run around with it. And I was like, oh, I will just turn those guys into mist. Fuck those guys. They think they're tough. I actually, at the time, thought I could have been dying. That's a whole other thing. I thought I might have had testicular cancer. So like, oh, damn. That's a whole, I have this kind of mystery injury. It got sorted out. Like, and I've been in physical therapy and I'm actually, I don't need a cane. I'm dancing and whatever, but good, I was in good. constant pain. They would not prescribe me anything. I didn't have like a primary care. And they're like, well, whatever. We'll get it figured out eventually. Just get MRIs. Like, it could be this. It could be that. And I'm like, maybe I'm just going to go gun a bunch of fucking white supremacists down <laughs> and I get killed. And that's how that goes. <laughs> you were ready, and dude. It was like, it got bad, but we got, they had people like staying over, being like, kind of took shifts, staying up all night and stuff. And they're like, letting people that were, that we knew that were in the protest, like, stay in their place and stuff. It's like, okay. Like it ended up being okay, but at the time, watching that ramp up, like around me and around people, I knew it was like, 
how there was like, oh, people in like fucking Japan are joining in and burning shit down. Like, how weird is this going to get at ground zero of this? Right. And when the cop station burnt down, that was that night of like, are all bets off? Like, is the night after this going to be when like it gets fucked when they come back, when the empire strikes back? And then we got to be like, no, like, fuck you. Like, I mean, like, I knew I bought guns for a reason. Here we fucking go. That was a real thought at the time. So wow. I was like, this won't stand. Like, it was kind of weirdly unifying, too, because me and every old aging band weirdo that I'm friends with were all like, this is what I was talking about. Fuck <laughs> this. Like, you don't push my friends around. You don't just get to shoot black people, you fucks. That isn't how this goes. I pay your goddamn salary with my property taxes. <laughs> like, no, no. Like, it's time to, yeah. So that that's what that was like, where it was very, like, scary and sad, but then also sort of like, well, for for a minute there, we were kind of all on the same page, though, because like, everyone blocked all their shitty dirt road relatives that were like, they should really find a better way to protest. Like, everyone just stopping. <laughs> we separated yeah. ourselves from that. We knew where we stood. We had, it, yeah, it was odd. It was like terrible. What I don't, and it's like still, it just happens here still. Like, they put that guy in jail or whatever, which is good, but like other cops, like that lady that was like, oh, I thought my gun was my taser. And like, right. that happened. 16 blocks from here Jesus. It, 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 the other day during that dude's fucking trial i remember so like, oh, yeah, yeah. We sure fixed everything guy like it, it yeah living in minneapolis right now is strange because it's like also it's a it's a uh industrious affluent city in the midwest but it's also like horrific shit it will occasionally go down and then people will get up in arms and and like helicopters will be flying around like oh yeah that's over but that's over more above downtown look out the window it's wugga, 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 wugga. like oh man following it on unicorn right like oh shit it's happening like yeah, i'm gonna take a different way to work later honey when you go like <laughs> the fucking hospital downtown like yeah it it is it that that was like that thing where besides the i guess the pandemic but like you know tell the imaginary grandkids like that was some history i was at yeah. Well, yeah, and I was just going to say it's all in the background of this global pandemic that we're all collectively experiencing. You have this huge like civil rights movement right yeah. right in your backyard, you know? Fuck. The biggest that ever has happened to date. Yeah. Like, by all counts, because of the global participation. Yeah. Well, you know, and that did happen because of the pandemic, too, because it didn't, there was no football. There's fucking, everyone was home. Like nothing was happening. It was hot. Right. And everyone was just watched this thing happen for eight solid minutes and was just like, what the fuck? Like it, it didn't get swept away under like, yeah, but you know, the, cause they weren't even making regular ass TV. Like nope. they're the mass singer. Oh, we can't have an audience. Like just, there was nothing kind of, it's like, well, we watched everything on Netflix. The crown hadn't came out yet or whatever. Like <laughs> the chess one, like none of that. So there was like this dip in that, like, um, uh, who's like uh, uh, Bill Hicks, you know, the the whole like, what's the football? A drink of beer. It's like, oh, the beer and football's gone. So then everyone yeah. is just like, well, what's happening in the world? And they're like, uh, this just did. Yep. And everyone was like, well, that, well, that's a hell of a thing. No. And that, that had, like, if that had happened at any other, you know, in like 2002, like, would it have popped off the same way? No. I don't think it would have. No, because. And Derek Chauvin wouldn't have even have gone to trial. Right, okay. it would have got swept under the rug because there wasn't like video evidence. There wasn't like a like it, the the viral yeah. the the virality of it all. I mean, it got shared so quickly, and it was in everybody's news feed so quickly, and it, it immediately became like the topic of conversation for fucking everybody. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, and yeah, and if the pandemic wasn't happening, you'd have. And that's the one thing I noticed because I was on tour when the pandemic started. When they canceled sports, I was like, yeah. I was like, this is fucked. Like, yeah. you're going to cancel fucking sports. And that's when I knew I actually had a plan. I was going to, because I was living in Long Beach at the time, I was going to grab my van and I was going to drive to my mom's backyard and I was just going to camp out there, get a gun, and I was just going to piss and shit in a hole in her backyard. <laughs> and I was just going to do whatever I could to make sure, A, I don't get her sick, and B, I protect her from, you know, looters. I mean, I thought there was going to be a water shortage. I thought, like... Well, it, there was, no, again, that... That bar graph of, you know, the band stuff we were talking about, yeah. there was no reason to believe that all those panic buying shortages and stuff wouldn't continue right. into just 
everything. There was nothing saying that that wouldn't happen because ever, even that gas thing that just happened, like people are fucking stupid. Yeah. And it's just, they cause all of these things to happen because someone's like, we might, and toilet paper of all things, but we're like, well, okay, but there's probably going to be more stuff. And somehow the supply chain didn't go down of, you know, like, cause we didn't know. It's like, maybe this thing is like, would have like a 50% mortality rate instead of right. like, whatever it was where it kills very vulnerable people. And also I'm glad, I'm still glad I avoided it because there's like long hauler effects that you don't want. Like I was gladly vaccinated team Pfizer, baby. I was like, yeah, fuck this. Like, I don't want, but my brain is foggy enough from all the drug use. I don't <laughs> right. need it worse. My lungs are fucked enough from everything else. I don't need those right. worse. Like I don't need any of this in my life. Like I, I'm not going to be oh, risk it. like, no, 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 I know I'll live, but then I will just, ride all of these things that i've already overclocked and overdrawn for so many years I'm like no 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 no. alexis is younger than me i'm trying to hang out as long as i can with her I, i'm not letting this happen but there was nevertheless at the time we we're like well it could just be fully like ebola like it, 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 we could run out of everything to be like no we can't run trucks full of food because people it's like the stand they'll just die we're like, uh, so like, what are you going to eat besides, you know, cracking open your neighbor's skull and feasting on the delicious goo within, you know, and that, you know, and then who's, who's got the guts for that? Like, there's all these fucking, uh, what if I attacked a meal team, six tough guys, but uh, well, meal we'll, team. We'll countryside <laughs> stealing shit, but you know, it, it, it I think it, whoever would uh, become the head of the cannibal tribe might surprise you. <laughs> and you, you don't know which yeah. way it's going to come from. Or whether or not you just take a cyanide pill, like it, yeah. But that was all at the time. Pissing and shitting in a hole with a gun was like a person perfectly reasonable response to that because you're like, I don't know how weird this is gonna get. Exactly, and uh, yeah, I I adore my mother, and she like my girlfriend. We just signed a lease in Long Beach, and she convinced me to stay. Right, so yeah, and so but then I had to kind of like remotely make sure. That my mom didn't fucking leave the house because she's at really high risk. Which she's been a smoker since she was 15 years old. She just turned 73, so she was 72 during the pandemic. Um, with like she has COPD from smoking cigarettes for 50 something plus years, you know. And if so, if she got COVID, it would be over. Like her lungs are yeah. already terrible. And so all I was thinking is just like I got to protect my mom, you know. But yeah, I ended up just staying in Long Beach, and my mental health just deteriorated to the point where I had to intervene with medication, and I'm doing better now. We're living in Michigan. The cost of living in the Midwest, Jesus Christ. Yeah, I own property here. Like, yeah, that's I can't do that in California. Like, you have to. I I just saw this graph. You have to. You have to have a salary of over a hundred thousand dollars if you want to own a house in California. Yeah, and which is just which, like. like you know, if you if you're a Silicon Valley person and you know what you can definitely do, but it's like somebody has to pump gas and sell coffee. And it's like, okay, so I guess those guys just get to live in tents even though they work 40 hours a week or more. Like, yeah, that that whole thing is bull. I mean, it's one of the reasons I bought it was like kind of scary when I decided to buy a house. Like it would have been better five years ago, but I didn't really have the means five years ago. But it's still continuing to rent now is and boy this is boring old guy talk but like that <laughs> idea terrified me i'm like dude living under someone's thumb who might just be like yeah i think the the property value's gone up i'm just gonna sell the place figure out like dude i don't fuck like i like because my whole life has been in, in an effort to have no one i mean no one that i could see anyway there's obviously like so <laughs> many people that could just push me around out there but generally speaking in my immediate sphere not being under the thumb is all i've ever wanted not have a boss not have somebody go, hey so yeah, the bank could still fuck me, but it's like technically like, yeah, this is my place. I got to pay it off. But it's like, again, I, I'm just paying what I used to be paying in rent to rent a house yeah. with me and Alexis and two roommates. Like we're here by ourselves in a nicer, bigger place. And it's like the same amount of money. I mean, it was a lot of scary bullshit making it happen. And right. Oh my God, it's worse now than it's ever been. But after getting over that hurdle, it's like, anyone that's like oh yeah we're looking for an apartment i'm like i feel fucking so bad like god it sucks yeah it's so much money and you're just because at least when i'm spending here i mean i've been kind of been reinvesting in something you're just paying for someone else's groceries yeah and, you, and it just makes me crazy thinking about it i'm like because it's they it made it so hard that it's like yeah you can kind of get out of that ripoff but then we made it harder than ever to 
Like I had a big moment. I was just talking to, you know, Alexis's mom who's awesome and, and has helped us figure a lot of things out and is a smart, cool lady. But I had that moment where I, I, I witnessed firsthand the older generation not realizing they had it easier than us, not harder than us. Right. And she was like, oh, use the first time homebuyers thing. And I'm like, well, no, that's just like a different loan to help you get the down payment. So you're just paying two separate loans. One of them has like way higher. It's like, that's terrible. It's like, no, no, no. They just, they just give you the money. And I'm like, <laughs> you're funny, Deb. Yeah, no one does that. She's like, no, they didn't. I looked into it like, oh yeah, they just, there used to just be a program when you bought your first house. They just, the, the state would just give you your down payment. And I'm like, hey, you motherfuckers look at us like, mm. and it's like everyone you voted for took that away so that your property value would go up once you bought in. And you're like, we'll figure it out. Da, da, da. So you guys got it so easy with your phones and everything. I'm like, yeah, okay. They used to just give you money. You didn't have to pay back. Wow. And I did, I literally, because, and I'm not even, I'm not 20, I'm 40. And I was like, I thought she was pulling my leg. Right. Like, I laughed at her face. She was being dead. She was, we're having a conversation as adults. Yeah. I was like, ah, yeah, right. Like, I literally didn't believe it because it sounded so outlandish. Like, oh, nobody just gives you anything. And I'm like, oh, me, one of the older members of the generation that just gets everything handed to him. And by that, I mean, I laughed when someone suggested that that was possible. And apparently it was just the norm. It's a thing that was available to them. Wow. And then they, they they basically drank from the river and turned around and put up their walls like that system of a down sign. Thanks, <laughs> like, a lot. Thanks a lot, boomers. Well, yeah, you, yeah. You're, you're actually, this whole conversation is, is making me reconsider. Yeah, uh, we, we could own property out here. That's the thing. Is it, like, cause, oh, oh, so, yeah. so the same graph I was looking at where it's like the, the median salary to buy a house uh, f- for every state. And in, yeah. in Michigan, it's 40 grand. You have to make 40 grand a year and you can buy a house out here. And it, yeah, in California where we were living, we were renting a fucking one bedroom apartment in the fucking, in a bad neighborhood where people were getting shot all the time. And it was $1,400 a month for a fucking closet in a bad neighborhood where there was human shit and just fucking body bags. It, it was Yeah, that's that's well north of my mortgage, Neil. <laughs> In Minnesota, and I live in Minneapolis. I'm not even out in the boonies. Like this right. is in the city. I have like kind of a big yard for the city. Like, and that's it's. Yeah, well, that was the thing. And I mean, you know, God bless all you guys that moved up to California. But whenever people like turf or like, yeah, I'm gonna. You need to if you want to make it, you got to go out here. And I'm like, I think I'm past living with eight dudes and paying more than buying a house. Yeah, to live in some fucking. Squ- I'm like, I'm straight. I'll 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 fail some other way. Turf, turf seems to be making it work, um, at least from like, you know, objectively. Oh, I'm, I'm sure. I, I haven't talked to him in a while, but right. Uh, but then again, it's like we were making it work, but that didn't make it fucking fun. That didn't make it not suck. No, we were making it work, but we had to bust our fucking ass for fucking a one bedroom apartment in long beach like it it was cool you could walk to the beach but that walk was filled with people trying to sexually harass my girlfriend a and b human and dog feces and c some of the most like intense fucking violent aggressive homeless you know and and god bless their heart you you know but it it just was unsafe it was it was just it didn't feel safe i felt like i was constantly agitated and anxious and just like looking over my shoulder and making sure no one was going to fucking try to assault my girlfriend who couldn't walk to the fucking corner store without being fucking harassed and and yeah and it was super expensive and on top of it it caught on fire and you, yeah you couldn't see the sun because literally the mountains were on fire and it would like just black and out uh, in this orange like blackish red dark. yeah it was like this it was Getting like total so, recall mars yes like, exactly <laughs> doomsday shit like yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that was No, and it's 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 not okay to live in fear, especially when you don't have to. We built this perfectly good society so we don't have to skin animals with homemade stone tools for warmth. Like, right. <laughs> we we figured we made this deal with each other. We're like, okay, look, like some people are gonna fucking invent cars and some people are gonna like make you coffee and you know, you you just pick one of these things to do and then you get to like live inside. And like wolves don't eat you, and highwaymen don't <laughs> rob you. Like highwaymen. And when you live somewhere where you're you're participating, you're working, and you're you're scrambling, and you're you're putting all of this stuff into it, and it's like, and, and then people are just trying to murder you and harass you and stuff. It's like, well, why don't I just live in the fucking woods then? If that's how you know. So and, and yeah, and that is kind of why I always just hung around here because. 
things get a little wild here occasionally. And obviously the, 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 the global fucking protest started here and all that yeah, stuff. That's kind of wild. <laughs> I feel even after all that though, I feel safe here. Like Alexis, like there, there's just ladies with their dogs jogging around the park. There's an elementary school over there. I'm like, yeah, it's, it's, it's in the city, but it's fine. And I don't feel the least bit of, um, you know, guilt. It's like, you know, I think you're just judging people that don't have homes. And I, you know, you live, you just got to know them. I'm like, okay, look, man, there's some people that are down in their luck for sure. Yeah. And there's some people who just, the, the system has failed. Like they're not okay to be yeah. roaming around loose. No one's ever helped them. And, but this is America. So you're just, oh, you're just a rugged individual. It's like, that's, that's his problem. It's like, no, that's going to be your problem too. Like all those bees in that guy's beard are going to come at you when you run into him, even though you're like, oh, yeah, well, why don't they just figure it out? I'm like, well, they're on drugs and they were raised by an 11 year old who had them in a one bedroom apartment. And now they just like to stab people like that does happen. And it's a thing. It's not, you know, you can't just like s- summarize an entire group of people and say they're all no. that, but there are those exceptions that there are, I mean, some some of these motherfuckers that we'd run into on our walks were like legitimately scary and dangerous and it was you know it was just like this is fucking scary you know I, and I'm a big dude too I'm not like e- easily intimidated but then again it's like I don't know if this person has a gun or a knife or if they're going to throw yeah. shit at me I don't know what's going on so. Well we're not getting any younger we can't just be like fighting people who think that like we're the devil and working for the CIA like Every right. time we go out to get a sandwich at the fucking gas station, like yeah, that, I'm tired. Yeah, man. And that, and that, and again, that's I'm tired. Kind of my reasoning for being like, I'm going to put a little more stock into being stable and comfortable, but also I don't want to. I don't. I'm a busy guy, but I don't run myself ragged, even to own like a, a decent house. Like I intentionally, it's like, could I have a boat in a cabin? I'm like. I could, or I could just work less and just have a house and a car that works. Like, there you and that's go. Don't, don't kill yourself. And, and that's the other thing too, is I, I remember, um, you know, when we were talking about these mentalities, like suffering, good art comes from suffering. I also had this mentality for the longest time that, that if I'm not grinding and if I'm not like working super, super, super fucking hard, that I should punish myself at least mentally in my brain. And it, it and yep. I feel so good. And I think the pandemic kind of had me realize this, like, okay, you can work really hard and you can go really hard, but you deserve a little Final Fantasy VI time. You fucking earned that. You deserve a little just, like, hang out on the bed and, and jerk off it, it, like it, on your fucking stomach hair. Like, you you, yeah. you earned this. And I think that's – I've been trying to be more patient with myself and be like, dude, like, your father's dead. You don't have to prove him wrong by, like – achieving some sort of grandiose thing in your life you can literally just like work really hard when you have to and then when you can relax when you want to when you're burnt out when you need to rest it's okay you who are you who are you trying to prove anything to and these are the conversations i have with myself because yeah, just yourself basically that's it you're your own slave driving boss and if you yeah. want to quit you can tell yourself to fuck off <laughs> or take a break well within your right yeah but uh but yeah that's the one thing you know, the more therapy I did, the more I realized it's like the, 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 uh, so much of me trying to become this successful musician was just trying to spite my father who told me I couldn't do it, you know, which is wild. And then when he passed away, it's like, OK, so why am I doing this now? And I had to kind of be like, well, because I like it. I like this. I I enjoy this, you know, and I still do. But but the. But there's not this, like, pr- I'm not putting this pressure on myself to fucking do great things anymore. I just want to live. I want to eat. I want to do what I like and grow old somewhat comfortably, you know? That's the smart thing to do. And that's, you know, that's what you owe to yourself. Like, that is, you know, it, and by the way, my joke I had was at least you had uh at least you had an excuse. I don't fucking know who I was trying to impress. Right. <laughs> I was just doing it for no fucking reason. I didn't know but, until very recently, though, that that was like the oh. the underlying motivation for like all of my obsessive, uh, you know, hopes and dreams to become some sort of person of notoriety. You know. Yeah. 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 That's very reasonable. I think. You know, whatever. Whatever. <laughs> my deep seated thing is probably similar to, or I would just. I would hate for 
whoever it is to think maybe just other people I went to high school with or who fucking knows to be like, Oh, Hey, look at that guy. He's doing stuff. But I don't know, man, like living, living your life happily and comfortably seems like something that if, if you're looking to make anybody jealous, <laughs> that that'll do just fine on its own because people run their shit ragged for no goddamn reason, not doing anything fun all the time. And yeah. you're like, hey, what have you been up to? Like, oh, I don't know. I started a podcast and I fucking, uh, wrote some music for this guy making an indie film and it was working with it was kind of fun they're like whoa like i put <laughs> tiles in bathrooms and that's yeah. it like, like <laughs> oh shit i mean i liked tiling my own bathroom upstairs but i fucking yeah like damn like oh 20 years of that huh sounds like, like work so you realize you're like running yourself ragged to try to be like i gotta be bigger than what i saw on mtv and you're like but in reality you're you know if you're if you're doing it right you're having more fun and being more fulfilled than and not that it's a competition to be like, I'm more fulfilled than everybody else. But it's like, if you just look at it on that averaged out scale, you're like, oh, you're doing fine. Like, and there's no reason to beat yourself up for not fucking being like, yeah, but you know, how come I don't have the number one thing on this and whatever? It's like, did you have fun doing it? Like, uh, uh-huh. it's like, well, then you need to be grateful that you were able to do something you were having fun doing and just figure out a way to enjoy that. Because man, if you think of how the animal kingdom and, Two million years, maybe ish of human existence. How fucking cutthroat, terrifying, short lifespan, whatever. Like the moment we're living in now, if you can kind of just like do shit you enjoy and have people you've never met go, hey man, that's cool. Like, dude, that's great. Yes, <laughs> that's what. Yeah, what the fuck could you possibly ask for? You have you have spices in your kitchen that people used to have to sail around the world to get. Like everything's going pretty good. Yes, you really take some stock in it. See and. I, this is shit I need to hear, you know, that's that perspective. And that's why I enjoy doing my little podcast is because yeah. I, I'm, you know, I talk to people that I know. I talk to people that I don't know, but I always get little nuggets. The, the, the spice nugget you just gave me. Yeah, people used to have to fucking sail around the world to collect that shit. And I have a whole fucking cupboard full of it. And all I have to do is go five minutes to the store down the road to obtain these items. Himalayan sea salt. Just bought a big fucking thing of Himalayan sea salt, man. Crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, it's like not even two dollars. <laughs> like it's crazy tumorac. Like they used to have to go to Egypt and fight people with swords. <laughs> shit. Like like yeah, yeah, it's three bucks a cup. Yeah, it's good for you. And it's, and it's funny, too, because, you know, I found myself complaining about the price of these organic spices with, <laughs> without even, like, having this conversation, you know? I'm not going to complain about that shit anymore. Just saying. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, this this organic turmeric is, is way more expensive at Sprouts than it is a Kroger, you know? Yeah, it's like, I gotta oh, go. My... They only have this at Whole Foods. I Come on, Neil. Look at me. It's like, yeah, but did you have to ride on an elephant for like three weeks <laughs> to the mountains? <laughs> no? All right, then. And you're fine. Oh, geez. So, hey, I, on this note, I... I preferably don't like to go over two hours on this thing. We're, we're getting there. Yeah, I think we I think we kind of came around to the beginning anyway. I think we kind of got back to the whole gratitude of, uh, of living your life, you know, that we almost kind of started on. So, But uh, that being said, I I would love to do this again and have a part two because we, I'm sure you and I could bullshit for many hours. I'm just, oh like, I've done, like, during the pandemic, I did enough of these, like, four-hour episodes of the podcast, and I'm like, who would even listen to this for four hours, you know? Like, it's, like usually an hour and a half is, I think, my sweet spot, you know? I think that's, that's I try to keep, uh, which your setup is actually far more professional, but I try to, I try to keep Rum Dumpster at about, an hour 30. Yeah. Cause it really starts getting, especially play. we have a lot of guests that don't drink, but we have guests that do that last <laughs> 25 minutes starts being like, Hey, $5, right. get out of here. Like, <laughs> I don't know what the fuck's happening anymore. I'm watching it. Like, I don't remember anyone saying this and you can't even hear it. Right. Like, yeah. So they have an hour and a half. That is a good spot. It's 90 minutes. That's a, that's a delivery fucking shift. It's something you listen to in your car. Like you're making somebody stay better. Good. Yeah. And, that, and that's all I hope. But like ultimately and selfishly doing these podcasts actually makes my mental health better. So like, it's weird. I started doing this shit just cause Harry Bob's like, dude, you need a podcast. Cause he, he got all in, into like Joe Rogan, Ari Shafir and stuff. This was back in like 2012, yeah. like a while back. And he's like, he's like, you know, you know, all these people you can, uh, you know, 
talk to him and record it. And I was just like, what's a podcast? I remember, <laughs> I remember we were driving around. Uh, he, he, he would rejoin the band periodically to do certain tours we got offered. Um, like we have like a Rolodex, like the band downtown Brown essentially is like a collective at this point where we just have a Rolodex and, uh, you know, we get offers and I just see who can do it pretty much. So, <laughs> yeah. But, well, you know what, you know what that's called? If you're, if you're not being so humble, it's called Neilis downtown Brown. That's, that's what that is. That's weird. And you have your usual suspects. I should, I should say though, that I am also, I will say that Harry Bob is right. I, uh, it's funny too. Cause I kind of got entry leveled in not as long ago, but kind of through Joe Rogan, I discovered Tom Segura, Bert Kreischer, like all these other people who I like listening to Doug right. Stano. Doug's uh, great. Whatever, like, and they're, they all have podcasts and stuff and I like it, but I, I, I do say that out of a lot of people I know, I'm really glad you went this way. Cause I think that, yeah, it, that <laughs> you're the right kind of guy where you have all these stories and you're funny and you yell, you know, and I, Probably the same way some people feel. Oh, I'm glad John Wheeler's a dickhead on the internet now because we can still watch him that way. But I Me feel too, that way man. about you. Oh, thank I'm you. Just like I want, I want like Neil Neil P would be wasted not being, you know, having a TikTok page and a podcast and stuff like that. It would be like all that good stuff, all the people you know, all your takes on things, all the yelling, all the weird, <laughs> like even the in, in particular the. Uh, I think it was on Instagram or something. I saw the clip of you and. Ron, who was your one bass player that was really weird that you just had on? Ron. And your, yeah, your clip was just this adult swim bumper acid fever. Like, just like, and just all, I'm like, yeah, the world needs that. I, <laughs> and I, so I was like, if you hadn't gone this way, it would have been disappointing. Well, that's just what, what that's honestly, that's just what happened when Ron is around. He talks about like, <laughs> he's like, I got my storage unit in this shirt I found after my divorce. And, you know, he it just <laughs> like he he literally is an alien, dude. That guy doesn't. Yeah, you're a magnet for aliens. I mean, you yeah. realize that, right? Like, yeah, that, dude. It's fun. That's why he was there is because of that, though. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah no, I'm, I'm just trying to suck your dick a little. I mean, yeah, I just. just I'm glad you're doing this and I would like to be on it again. And I, I will gladly any, any clips you want to make, I'll fucking share and try to make weird. And, and I, I like it. I like the whole thing. Oh, thanks man. Well, and that's the thing too, is I went like, I saw you were on TikTok cause I, I you commented on something and I wasn't following yeah. you yet. And I'm like, Oh, John Wheeler's on TikTok Cause I, I know you're a, a great videographer and you're a great video editor and I know you're funny and I know you're smart. So the same thing happened to me. I'm just like, yeah, fucking the, TikTok needs John Wheeler. So, so <laughs> what? No, seriously. So why, while I got you here, uh, plug, plug your shit because we're doing, oh, yeah. this is so, the thing. Um, my, uh, my, uh, branding is the alchemical cocktail lounge. Although I think you can, you can just look up John Wheeler, Reverend John Wheeler, and probably Google will direct you, but yeah, I have, I have a YouTube page where I have a few different things, a podcast and, um, a couple of like shows basically, um one's called i've never thought about it like that where i almost make like a weird uh educational program but where i'm yelling about bigfoot or or <laughs> uh, propaganda or, or some shit and like aliens and just being weird because it's like i have enough room for a green screen and i have all this camera shit so why, why yeah. wouldn't i um and uh yeah and my tiktok's the same thing alchemical cocktail lounge and uh reverend john wheeler what, whatever you put in there and it's just little clips of that and stuff that you know, I, it's weird where I it was like, oh, YouTube's the main thing, but it's like, almost like TikTok is like its own, its own platform to make weird, in which we brought up, but you, your own short form art insanity works really well on there. And yeah. uh, it's super fun and I'm, and I'm all about it. So that like those two video platforms are a thing that I'm super into pushing content and nonsense out onto it. Of course, if anyone out there needs, I have my dance cards a little full, but if you need any uh, audio mixing or fucking video stuff produced, I can do that too. But uh, you know, I'll, I'll get, I'll get back to you when I can, but mostly the funny stuff's important. I think. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I'm going to link all the stuff in the YouTube video below, but I, I feel like, yeah, TikTok is like, it's just little bits. And then YouTube is trying to catch up actually with YouTube is doing the shorts now, but like I you, noticed that, YouTube yeah. is for all that horizontal HD, 1080p, like long form content. Like I post, you a, turn it on when you're going to eat dinner. You're like, Oh, right. hey, this thing's 20 minutes long. I can actually sit and eat this plate of spaghetti without having to get up and push buttons. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but TikTok is great 
toilet entertainment because it's yeah. just like it's just like boom 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 it's like 10 second clip seven second clip seven second and it and it's funny too because i'm starting to really think of things um in like in kind of the scope of like is this gonna hit within the first five seconds and so like it's it's weird because i've always made at least for the past two and a half years been making all this long form content these really long drawn out like reaction videos and all these podcasts but now my brain is totally wired to like okay how can i make this funny in six seconds you know like well and that's that's you know it's funny that seems new but that's always been important and i guess like without dragging it out too long just real quick this is what i learned about doing stand-up but we haven't we didn't really glance on that whole thing but yeah we need to talk um, about that it it like the way that i make youtube videos now with tiktok in mind is i'm like if i make a 10 minute long youtube video i should be able to get if i really play my cards right 17 funny standalone tiktok clips out of it like there should be a setup and punch within every minute of those 15 minutes or whatever it is stand-ups like that too where it's like even comics that are guys that tell long stories there's still a minute or 30 seconds never goes by without a setup and punch, you know, smaller ones, maybe like we're right. in, they're building towards a hole with a way bigger one at the end. But nevertheless, you can't take out of truly brilliant comics, even if they're storytellers, you can still take any given two minutes out of it and be like, well, this is pretty amusing by itself. Right. And that is it. So when you start thinking of things like that, it does help your long form content also even, even if you're like, I'm just going to pretend I'm going to cut it up on TikTok and never do it, it's still better to write it that way. Because that way people kind of have these waves of like, oh, this is funny. Oh, this is, but where is he going? Well, this is funny. Oh, but, oh, the whole thing. That was really funny. And it's like, when you start thinking in terms of TikTok sized chunks, it helps you build a hole that's more engaging the whole way through yeah. for people. So I, it's it's helped me learn. <laughs> Definitely. And that that i i have to process what you just said usually what i do is when after i do the podcast i listen to it like three or four times just on my earbuds when i'm like doing stuff going to the gym and stuff because I, i'm really able to ingest it so i'm i'm looking forward to listening back to that part a and b and b there's um there's a dude named andrew schultz are you aware of schultz yeah. okay yeah, yeah he um during the pandemic he started doing this thing where he was like he would like read off the news or he it was kind of like a glasses off thing where he would just be sitting and it would be it would seem like a monologue but it was scripted and it was just it 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 was really good they were like these 6 minute youtube videos but pretty much it would be nothing but but jokes but like he also would be talking about something seriously at the same time and i thought that like like what he was doing and actually like Rogan was talking to Chappelle about the way he formatted those videos was like a new way of stand up comedy. And of course Chappelle is like that's not stand up. But it well, like but regardless I thought like what he was doing it kind of like what you were describing kind of reminds me of that because it, it's like it's a long well, thing. I'm being honest I was I was ripping him off a little when I was coming up with my YouTube like bits I was oh, doing yeah? where I was like ooh it's almost like stand up but kind of canned and with effects and cuts and yeah he was an inspiration for me also doing yeah kind of, it's different and it's not as good obviously right but i was like "Ooh, you can just do that okay well hey i have a camera <laughs> yeah because like within that six minutes there's like like you said there's a setup and a punch like every 30 seconds and he's yep. and he's saying something pretty fucking funny and so that that keeps you engaged the whole six minutes you're just like oh this is hilarious and then but at the end you're like and i learned something too you know <laughs> so yeah yeah i yeah he's a funny guy there's a lot the, it, the internet is is wrought with like inspiring people if if you can look at it through the lens of uh where you're not just like, oh, well, fuck that person because they're successful. I used to be like real jealous about it, the people that were like killing it. But now I look at things like I just watching this Bo Burnham special. I'm just like, wow, you can do all that in a room with fucking a camera and like some good editing. Like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, it blew my fucking brains out of the back of my skull, dude. So, yeah. No, picking that stuff apart is a real good way to make yourself better. Like, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's there for you to learn from, you know? I just want to make cool shit before I die. Yeah. Well, that's always been the plan. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's kind of my new mantra because it used to be like, uh, I want to be a person of notoriety. It's like, no, well, that might ever, not ever happen. So, A, I want to enjoy my life and I want to enjoy the process yeah. of living and making stuff. And B, when I leave this earth, I want to have, 
you know, some cool shit left behind where people could be like, oh, you know, that guy did this, that guy did that. Um, I think Steve-O was saying something on it. Like Steve-O from Jackass was on a podcast. Yeah. Was saying something about how uh, being filmed all the time is like that's I, – I'm paraphrasing and I don't even know if it's even close to what he said. But something about like that's his legacy is the fact that like – He's just going to be leaving behind, leaving behind the, like a plethora of these moments where he was just as alive as he possibly could be in those moments. I, I, I think you're, I think you're pretty right on with that. Because I don't I, know. <laughs> I was listening to like every everything that he was a guest on in all of my comedian podcasts that I regularly yeah. listen to, especially if I have to like drive out to like a shoot somewhere, God knows where. Like just those really help. And yeah, there was a rash of. Steve, like grown up, sober Steve. He's everywhere. Stories and and it, yeah, me being like, uh, yeah, I was super interested in everything he had to say. And I think I think you got it. That's kind of what he was going off about. Yeah, but uh, and also like I can relate to that dude similarly. Not because uh, we used to do stupid stunts and like jump off things and light <laughs> our balls on fire, but we did we. We were putting ourselves in dangerous scenarios like on the regular and all. Uh, you know, in an effort to entertain strangers. And so, and, and then, you know, it was fueled with drugs maybe not, yeah. like, maybe not as much PCP as he was on, but, but still like when I think of Steve-O being sober and being in his forties and being mindful and being like, e- e- like empathetic and sensitive and, and aware yeah. of himself, it's it like, it kind of, I'm, I'm like, dude, th- this is like, this is what it's about, especially when like you see Bam Margera fucking up the way he is, and Steve. O- yeah, yeah, it's like a, a yin and well, no, it's, it's not really even, but it's like some kind of the two wolves inside of you. One is Steve O, and one's Bam Margera. Like, which yeah. one are you gonna feed? <laughs> not Bam Margera, man. I want to be like Steve O. Yeah, and I think we all do, and I think that's why he resonates, especially with us in our generation at our age. You know, like, yeah, okay, you had your thing like that but it's like you're probably having more fun now that that's in the rearview mirror <laughs> you're like not yeah because he'd be de- he'd be dead by now i think a few of us would not put the brakes on to be close or oh, at least yeah. really sad absolutely you know? yeah so, so steve-o is a is a role model <laughs> yeah you know as weird as it is to say i fucking yeah i really respect and look up to that guy for sure and th- with the sobriety thing and uh you know, just like the whole being mindful thing, the kind of like his his ability just to I don't know, he just seems deep. He's a deep guy. I'd love to talk to him if I could, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey man, let let's cut this for now because we're about yeah, to yeah. But I appreciate you being here. Yeah, this is my podcast and you have a podcast and we're, yeah, we're just we're we're white men in our early forties making podcasts. Hey, well, so, yeah, finally that's happening. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in all seriousness, I didn't think I'd make it to 30. So being 40 is like a gift in a weird yeah, way. It's a little bonus. And I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you and I could catch up a little bit and, yeah. and I will be following you on TikTok. and I'm right now. I'm just, I'm hitting the switch right now. I don't know which cameras on who right now. I'm just kind of pressing these buttons. One, two, one, two, one, two. There's you. There's me. Yeah, hey. yeah. So <laughs> let's. I'm getting loopy, man. Let's let's cut it. But um, all right. But I, hey, John Wheeler, I'm proud of you, man, and and I'm glad we reconnected on the TikTok, and I'll be watching your content. And uh, who knows, maybe we can collab or something in the future here. Oh yeah, we should probably do some real awful music together. I think that might be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> let's get, let's get stupid. All right. Yeah. You hit the red button, and I'm gonna go piss because I've been waiting. Yes. All right, Neil. I love you. Love you, brother. We'll talk soon. Later. Bye.